Yes, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The vice mayor has called the meeting to order. Mayor Davey? Councilmember Kaplan? Here. Councilmember Laredo? Here. Vice Mayor London? Here. Councilmember McCormick? Here. Councilmember Moss? Here. Councilmember Segarola? Here. Mr. Vice Mayor, we do have a quorum. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. To the flag. Of the United States, States of America, to the, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty and, and justice for all. The first item, Mr. Vice Mayor, is brief comments by council. Who would like to make a comment? Anybody? I think we need to uh, acknowledge and observe that Mr. Winton is here in person. Mr. Who? Tony Winton. Okay. Anybody, um, like to make a, anybody want to make a comment? I I think we have a decision before us. We tried uh, at the end of last meeting, we're in the midst of the last meeting to develop a protocol to allow a uh, resumption of in-person attendance. That has not yet come together yet. So without, you know, a green light, a uh, gentleman is here. I think okay. advice of council was that there is no differentiation between the press and the public. We're aware of the notion that other people wish to be in person in attendance. So here we are. Okay, anybody else want to comment on that? Mr. Vice Mayor. Ignacio? Um, my position has not changed from last time. I believe he and other members of the public should be allowed in last time and today. Um, last time we took a vote and we came to a unanimous uh, conclusion that we asked the administration to have procedures and the facilities ready for today to be open to the public. I'm greatly disappointed that it has not come to pass. That notwithstanding, that's my position and it has not changed. Anybody else like to comment? Manager. Well, if you want, I'll go that? after the manager. No, sir, I defer to you. Louis? No, uh, notwithstanding how you feel about this, uh, the fact of the matter is today, you know, you know how fanatical I am about playing by the rules. The rules are no human being because of their safety and the safety of this community, whether you're a press person, uh, a walk, a, a dog walker or, a, or anybody else is not, it's not allowed in this room, period. Those are the rules. And I believe that we have to obey by the rules. So I think it's very simply, rather than spend another half hour like we did last time, and I'm, I'm sorry that Mr. You know, and I'm a big fanatic of, of open press and access, which they have, those of you are listening, they have, like you, through the uh, electronics that we have. Uh, if, this beca if it is becoming a show, I think it's disrespectful to the integrity of this council and it's disrespectful to the concerns that we have about the safety. We are, I, I, I'm sure the administration will speak about the process of making this safe, but the bottom line is that at 6.15 today, the rules are no human being is in this room, and therefore my uh, suggestion is that to ask the, Mr. Winton to kindly uh, exit the room consistent with those rules and avoid another, uh, another spectacle like we had last week. You have full access to our proceedings and you have to, as all of us, have to play by the rules. Thank you. Brett, do you have any comment? On that uh, issue, no. I was going to bring up a, a quick Allison, comment about the incident that happened. Let's, let's stay on this topic. Okay. okay. Allison? Uh, no, I don't have anything Sorry. new to add. Okay. I, I, I thought the last meeting, like I think uh, either Frank or somebody said, that we voted unanimously that this meeting we would have people, not only the press, but other people to the maximum capacity could be safely put into this room. I understand when people talk about safety, uh, that we have a limited number of people that can be here. I don't know what happened, but somehow or other, we don't have people in this room. But I also probably believe that Tony thought we would have people here. I'm sure most other people might have thought we'd have people here. We don't have people here. It could be mixed signals. So we have to give them the benefit of the doubt that possibly he thought we could be here 
and now he's here. So that's where we are. Anybody else? Want to uh, let, let the record reflect. Let the record reflect that other media outlets that are just as, uh, as, as respectable have asked to be here and they have respected the rules and they're not here. Okay, thank you. So I this don't know has a miscommunications to... aside, Vice Mayor, we need to move on. This is, all, this, this is all becoming a charade, and, and, and I'm, I'm awfully upset that uh, Mr. Winter, whom I respect, would put us with this twice. twice. Vice Mayor, with, with all due respect, can I speak on tonight? Oh, sure, please do. Since you all are talking about the administration, and that is me, uh, we did say that we would do everything we could to have that meeting room safe for tonight. We called the people who do the plexiglass, to make it safe, we are amongst every other government and every other private entity that's fighting for resources. They promised us they would do the best they could. We've been told May 3rd, May 10th, but we reached out immediately to make sure we could put plexiglass and make it safe for you all and for the community that came in there. Number two, we had to also, since people were not going to show up, provide a sound system that was consistent with somebody being able to hear what you were saying while they were in the council chambers through a speaker system, which we don't have set up right now. We were able to at least get an answer from our engineers who told us it would be six weeks before they could put such a system in. I think if we were able to make the council chambers safe, with our glass separations and keeping people separate that we wouldn't necessarily have to rely on a virtual meeting. But the fact is that your administration has worked to make this happen. We are dealing with vendors. We don't produce the stuff ourselves and the vendors just did not and were not able to come through for this meeting. So I apologize on their behalf, but your administration has tried everything they can to make this safe. Mr. Winton is aware of that. We have not told anybody in the public that this was going to be a public meeting. We would do everything in our power to make it so. And uh, that's your report from your administration. Thank you, Chuck. Mr. Vice Mayor, may I say something else? Sure, please do. Um, with all due respect, I believe we're complicating something that is not that complicated. Uh, other cities, other municipalities are already having open meetings. Here I'm looking out, we have a setup where we have 15 chairs, socially distanced, and then we also have the podium in its regular position. Um, I think we, besides that, whoever wants to come here and fill this to capacity, given the fact that it's still a small council chamber, there should be no reason why 15 people can't come here with their masks on and speak at the podium when necessary. With regard to listening to the proceedings, I can't imagine any type of speaker system in this chamber, which will not cause a feedback. The simple solution is whoever is willing to come here in person has to be plugged in with an earphone to their phone, listening to the proceedings online, and that's it. it like that, we don't have to go out and spend a whole lot of money when people could just sit here on their phone, watching us and listening on the phone. It, it, it's that simple. Um, besides that, uh, again, we need to get this done much sooner rather than later. Like I said, other municipalities have beat us to this. Um, instead of dragging this on, I think we should just have a vote like we did last time and move on. Okay. Uh, let's have a vote. Uh, who wants to have... What, um, what is the vote? Sorry. You want to speak, Allison? I'm sorry. No, no. You, go okay. ahead. It's not, it's not to... It, it, the, my, the motion is to... Uh, it, it's, it, it's very simple. Again, uh, I, 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 I like to, okay, but it's, it's no one, no one is allowed at this meeting in person, period. Henceforth, that person who is here shall please at this moment depart this meeting consistent with the rules. That is my motion. Second, uh, I have a second. So I have a second. Sir, sir, would you please sit down? I have a, an alternate motion, I think. Let's, let's, uh, and I don't know if Council Member Laredo. Do we have a second or does the motion die for lack of a second? There was Here. no motion no, on my motion. Motion dies for lack of a second, okay. Ignacio. My motion is to permit Tony Winton to stay here. Simple yes or no. 
Anybody second the motion of uh, Ignacio? Uh, I think no, nobody seconds that motion. Frank, well, you're muted. Well, Frank wanted to say something's muted. Does anybody want to second or is it going to die? There's an observation I wish to share. Well, no, but before you get your, the question right now on the floor is a motion, either seconds or it dies. It bears on the decision to second or not. I think, I think maybe Chad could help me. I understand that cities around Miami-Dade that have not yet opened up. Stop, stop for a second. We have a motion. You want to second it or it's going to die? No, I, wanted, I want to ask a question that bears on the decision as to whether to second it or not. And the question is whether other cities have permitted single or multiple representatives of the press in advance of allowing the public generally to come back into in-person virtual meetings. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, Frank. Um, I, I'm not aware of that, but um, maybe there has been cities. I'm just not aware. Thank you. To move this thing forward, I'll second the motion. Any discussion or we're going to go call the question? Call it. I, I, sorry, I have something for discussion. Yes. Um, I, I'm not totally disagreeing with Ignacio that I think that we could say you need to listen on your own handheld device, but I'm not comfortable with just saying one person because they decided to come after being told not to gets to stay. So if there's any appetite for adding to this, that if any other residents up to 15 people want to come, then I, I, I would add that. I'll accept that as friendly amendment. We have one person here. We have capacity for, for 14. Ignacio, vote on yes. the Brett has I'll a like comment. To, I'll like that's a question uh, for the people who are in the room. I mean, it's your safety. I'm not in the room. I'm, I only vote if you guys are okay. If one of you are not okay, I, I cannot vote it um, because it's your safety. I am not okay. If you, if you feel unsafe would be the issue for me. Okay. Okay. So Luis is not okay, which means Brett will not vote for it uh, at this point in time. Any other discussion on the on the motion? So I just, it, you don't feel safe, Council Member Laredo. If, if that's your I don't answer, feel then safe I will not I, support that. I, 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 I don't feel safe. And even though I pro promised my wife that I would be calm today, I am absolutely shocked uh, that you would not see the unfairness of the action you're taking, where it's again, the, the this pandemic that we have of not playing by the rules. The rules, whether you like them or not, the manager already explained why he couldn't do it for today, are as they are. And there are, and people abide by those rules, except for one individual. And he did it last week, and he's getting his way again today. We're spending half an hour on this issue. Right. Unfortunately, I'm from the very simple school of obeying the rules. The rules are on today, the 27th at six o'clock, this council chamber is not open to any human being, press or otherwise, and there is no exceptions. Where I come from, what I learned in junior high school and elementary, uh, to the rules. So to me, it's as simple as that. But now we're into 20 minutes. So Mr. Winter had 30 minutes last week and 30 minutes today of what he wants, which is attention. Let's not do it. Let's just call them. Let's, let's go. Call them. This is ridiculous. We have no other uh, people to comment. Let's call the... Madam Clerk. What is the question? What, what is the motion? Sorry, the, the motion. The, mo the motion is to is to enable Tony to stay and to allow up to what 18 15 people, 15 people. Come in this, e this evening. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a yes vote is he stays, a no vote is he's not allowed to stay. The, no, the one thing is he stays and up to 15 people, 14 Correct. people can come in. Correct. Okay. So that's where we go. Madam Clerk. Councilmember London. I mean, excuse me, Councilmember Kaplan. No. Councilmember Loretta. No. Vice Mayor London. Yes. Councilmember McCormick. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Is that a no? I still yes, he said no. She said no. Thank mm -hmm. you. Councilmember Moss, please. Yeah, mine's no, because there's at least one council member that feels unsafe. Council member Segarola? Yes. 
Motion, Motion passed. passed. Uh, Tony, going to have to leave the room. What's the next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk? The next Mr. item Mr. is... Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to have to have some help. I uh, will turn to the manager to have the gentleman leave the room because he, just like he did last week, he does not want to do that. I believe I, he cannot hear what we have been saying. So I he was, doesn't uh, I was okay. folks, I was going to ask that and I'm glad you brought that up. If you wish, I will have the uh, officer who is outside uh, escort Mr. Whitten out, if that is your wish. All right, next time we need uh, Somebody asked, Mr. Winton, you can hear me now, can you? We voted for you to leave the room. Are you willing to leave the room on your own? Yes, but we recorded it. Sure, I'm sure you're going to record it. You're probably going to take pictures, and you would love it to be the police officer taking you out. I'm so sorry that you're taking this position. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, that's right. You're right. Let's move forward. So sorry. Gentlemen, excuse me as uh, I take two minutes to uh, call the officer, okay? No, it's okay. He's leaving on his own. Next item, Adam. The next item, Mr. Vice Mayor, is public comments. Okay. Oh, no. I, I'm sorry, Brett. Uh, I thought Brett had a discussion item under the previous agenda item. Yeah, I just, you know, I wanted to make a quick comment of the incident that occurred over the weekend. And, um, and, and I'm sure all of you have had a lot of people reach out to you. And, you know, I just want to make sure that the community knows that we're very much aware of the incident. Um, it was a horrible, a horrible crime. Uh, it's a criminal. You get it used with bored teens. I mean, this is a criminal and it was a criminal act. And um, I'm absolutely sure that with the technology that we have and the officers that we have, um, we'll be able to find this person and bring him to justice. Um, but I just want to make sure that the, that the public knows that, you know, we are on top of this and we need to put an end to this very quickly not become systematic or anything that continues here in keep the scene. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other brief comments from council? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, move to the next item. The next item, Mr. Vice Mayor, is public comments. Okay. Peter, can you read the instructions? Yes, no problem. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you watching us on Channel 77 on Comcast, Channel 99 on at and or streaming us live via the web on our website, if you do wish to comment on any topic to council, please dial the following number, 305-365-7569. Then please enter the meeting ID of 231-627-8415. For those if of I you just currently, sorry, go ahead, Pete. For those of you that are currently in the meeting and do wish to speak, please dial star nine on your telephones or if you're using the Zoom app, please raise your hand. Mr. Uh, Vice Mayor, I, I, you have I, any callers? Uh, Pete, before you unmute, I just want to make an announcement that if any of the members that are going to be speaking from the public um, are here to speak on the um, zoning item, which is 9A, there will be a public hearing on that item, and that will be a, the appropriate time to speak um, at that time. Thank you. First, first speaker. Our first speaker is telephone number ending in 288. Caller, if you would please dial star six to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Caller, you are live. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, uh, Karen Bieber, 798 Crandon Boulevard. Um, I'd like to speak about um, the insanity of the speeding on Crandon Boulevard specifically at the south end, but really all over. It's just, it's crazy and it's dangerous. Um, I also noticed uh, an incredible amount of people who just run right through the crosswalk. When people are crossing, the lights are flashing. Um, it's very scary. Weekends are the worst, I know, because we have so many people from off island coming to um, visit Crandon Park and build bags. I really believe the only thing standing between this moment and the terrible tragedy is time, unless something is done. Um, surprisingly, a lot of people don't know that the flashing lights mean you have to stop for pedestrians. I know it seems crazy, but a lot of people don't know. And I don't think we should stand on the ceremony of, well, they should have known to stop and, and watch somebody die. So if it's 
you know, I know we don't control, I believe we don't control Crandon, but if we can put red lights, if something could be bigger, maybe if there's some sort of enforcement, especially on weekends for people who frequently visit the key that they understand they, have to, they can't speed and they have to stop when people are crossing and the lights are flashing. Um, it's just, it's awful. It's scary. I've seen too many close calls. Um, I, I do believe that stopping for people in crosswalks um, is a Florida law, just like running a red light is. Um, this can have far greater, more grave consequences. So I, I'd like to see that this treated as the infraction that it is. I don't know. I know you can't answer it, but I don't even know if any tickets have ever been given for someone who doesn't stop for pedestrians crossing. Um, it's really, it's, it's, it's such a dangerous situation. And I know there's so many important items um, that council has to take care of and cover on the island, but I just think this has been going on for so long that I have to say something. So um, I ask you please to try to get this as a top priority. I, I do believe lives are at stake here um, and I'd love to see something done about it. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next speaker. Our next caller is telephone number ending in 501. Caller, please dial star six on your telephone. Caller, you are live. Caller, you are live. Caller with telephone number ending in 501. You are unmuted and live. Apologies for my late arrival. Welcome. Peter, Peter goes to the next one. Yes, sir. Our next caller is telephone number ending in 591. Caller, please dial star six on your telephone to unmute yourself. Caller, I'll uh, sign back up for 9A. Thank you. I'll sign back for 9A when you guys get to it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, caller. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor, Mr. Mayor, that's all the callers we have signed up currently. I want to go back to the one that did answer, see if they want to answer now. Mr. Vice Mayor, that caller is no longer on the line. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda. Next item. Someone. I just, Mr. Yeah, Vice Mayor? It's 906. Ed, I, I'm back. Oh, my gosh. Hi, Mikey. <laughs> How you doing? Mr. Mayor, our next caller is telephone number ending in 906. Caller, please dial star six to unmute yourself. And there's another lined up after that. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Michelle Estevez, 425 Great to Drive. Glad to be here addressing the council and recuperating from COVID. It's terrible, let me tell you. Um, I implore in the council this evening to please to take action and control. Um, over what we are facing here on the island by the juveniles and the teens that they are taking over. Uh, Council member uh, Brad Moss, thank you for your comment. But I think that this did not happen overnight. Uh, we all have seen this coming. We have all been seeing this that was growing and growing and growing. Um, we did not took proper actions within time until I have escalating uh, this terrible um, success that uh, actions that uh, we have lately. And I face this daily on all my properties. We don't have any more partinghood on the island. Do not exist. It's not the island that we used to raise our kids. It's not the island that we used to do things with our children. I I hear a comment from somebody that uh, they sign up their uh, child for a community service hours. When they need to fill up the form, they have to call the, the child to find out which grade they are. And I am not exaggerating. So it's not just that we can 
press charges just to the kids or having given the full power and support to the police chief. But like I keep saying, we have to keep the parents responsible. I am not asking the council and I'm not asking that, you know, we babysit, we give education to the kids and all that. But maybe as a solution is to hire some young counselors to be here in weekends, to do activities with them on the daytime, to do activities in the evening, bring music to the village green and talk to them to see what they want to, what they want to do, which one, you know, how they're going to be entertained and impose the curfew. I mean, if curfew is at 11 o'clock, okay, let's start pressing charges and let's start having the parents responsible at the same time. But we need to take over. Enough is enough. We cannot let this to continue to be happening. I have been facing skateboarders here at the square, at the Presbyterian church, at the, the property. I'm facing kids that they're minors and they're in the common areas without any parents. I go to knock on the door and the parents, they are not even home. So let's, let's take time to address this serious problem before this takes us all over and we all facing serious consequences. Um, if you, if one of the things to try is to hire some young counselors and uh, to see what they're gonna do, you can charge them a small fee. I'm sure they will pay uh, to keep the lights on in the village green. I think this past week can work, but they are seeing the actions of the police. Um, I'm asking you, please take over, take control. Okay. Don't let this to continue to be more than what is happening now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Our next caller is Angela Rizzi. Via the Zoom app, please unmute yourself now. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, um, I guess Michelle already put this into Please, and Angela, I'm sorry, could you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, thank you. My name is Angela Rizzi, 101 Crandon Boulevard, unit number 276, key column. Um, thank you for listening to, to, to us, because I am with a group of friends that we are literally a terrorized of the vicious attacks that we, that we witnessed this week. Um, and I couldn't agree more. I think we, we, we need to make the parents accountable for these acts. Uh, we now are scared to tell the kids not to go so fast or to do things because this is what's been going on. And we've been, we've been confronted before by very disrespectful kids that simply don't obey nobody. But this is something that is coming out of hand and, and kids can cannot become a war zone. And this is beyond anything we expected. This is criminal. I, I agree and I appreciate what, what Mr. Bradmos mentioned. This is definitely criminal. I hope the cameras, the surveillance videos, and anything in our power, even as parents, I don't think the police can handle this alone. We, the parents, need to speak up. We got to stop saying that, oh, he's a friend of my friend. I don't know them. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to follow things. We need to speak up. I really urge people, if anybody knows anything, even if he's the son of a friend, we need to tell the police and help the police transform this community where we are here. Good people, good citizens. This cannot be happening. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, Pete. Mr. Mayor, our next caller is telephone number ending in 673. Caller, please dial star six on your telephone. Caller, you were live. Please state your name <coughs> uh, and my address. Name is Frank. Thank you. Yes, my name is Franklin Weimer. I live at the Towers of Key Biscayne at 1111 Crandon Boulevard, apartment 804. And I'm calling with a comment on the beach replenishment, the sand replenishment and the dunes. Uh, the project overall looks great. I walked the entire uh, beach this morning and saw how smooth and uh, how the beach had been raised. And it looks really good, except when they got to the end of the beach by the Towers of Key Biscayne, it, it ended up it terminated in a giant mound of sand, which is there to replace the dune. But it looks to me like it's three or four times larger than what the dune needs to be. And it stopped at that point about, I don't know, 30 or 40 yards from the uh, uh, Bill Baggs Park. Um, the doc Dr. Samimi was kind enough to meet with one of the people 
in um, in our association and, and talk to him uh, to them about it. But I think he said there really wasn't going to be any modification made to the sand as to uh, from where it is today. Uh, there was going to be plants put on for the dune because we're short on dune plants. But I understood that that sand was going to stay there in a giant lump and not be uh, as closely tied into the rest of the dunes and all the way up to the park the way it was originally designed. And I noticed in the attachments to the meeting that, and I was also told that all the legal, uh, uh, legally permitted sand had been put on the beach. But I do see that there's still about um, 800 cubic yards available based on the information um, in the write-up uh, that goes with this meeting. So I'm calling to ask, will the uh, the beach in front of Key Biscayne be, uh, will be tied into the dunes better and kind of flattened out the way the, the rest of the beach is and look beautiful? Or is it, um, is this not going to happen? Thank you. I think we'll be uh, talking to that later on this evening. Okay, Mr. thank Mayor. you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, next caller is telephone number ending in 501. Caller, please dial star six to one. State your caller, name and address to the record, please. Uh, hi, this is Louisa Conway, 151 Crandon Boulevard. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, good evening, Council and, and Chief Press. Tonight, I would like to ask that Chief Press and the Key Biscayne Police Department please enforce the laws. Key Biscayne is one of the safest communities in Florida, which is why so many retired police officers choose to work to serve us. Blaming residents for not pressing charges or the parenting styles of our residents deflects from the root problem in our policing. The fact that our police is performing selective enforcement of our laws. We have had a rash of teen criminal behavior. The violators are not held accountable for their actions because our chief uses his discretion to decide whether or not to pursue charges against these teens. I appreciate Chief Press's philosophic approach to building positive interactions between our police officers and our youth. But this approach is having detrimental impact. On January 22nd, three teens driving the wrong way on Harbor crashed into a car. The teens appeared drunk. They threw their white claws in the bush and they left the scene of the accident. Key Biscayne police collected evidence, even held a lineup, press charges, and later charges were dropped because the evidence collected by KB police was discarded. This council needs to investigate police procedures and handling of the accident on January 22nd and determine why three teams who caused $15,000 of damage were not, ha not held responsible for breaking our traffic laws. I am asking this council to please stop placating the actions of our police department and continuing to be tone deaf to residents asking for more enforcement, more patrols and visible police presence on our island. Chief Press does tremendous work in philanthropy through his foundation in Liberty City. But the people of Key Biscayne need strong police management and enforcement and an end to the escalating violence that has befallen our paradise. A man was beaten on Saturday night to the head with a skateboard. That is called in the state of Florida attempted murder. It's time for Key Biscayne to take control of our streets, security and safety. And it is time for Chief Press to step down. Like any good soldier, you need to accept when your strategy on the battlefield has failed and is risking the lives of those you were sent to protect. Chief said he would be willing to step down when he is no longer effective. And counsel, the escalating mayhem in our village has clearly demonstrated Chief Press is no longer effective in protecting the people of Key Biscayne. We may be safe, but our sense of security has left us feeling vulnerable and ignored by this council and police department. Thank you. Next caller, please. Mr. Mayor, next caller is telephone number ending in 527. Caller, please dial star six now to unmute yourself.
telephone number ending in 527. Please dial star six to unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, please state your Good name and your address, please. My name is Marcela Castiglioni. I live in 442 Fairburn Road in front of the Village Green. And as I said previously, I want my kids came back. The kids came in which uh, I could walk in the street safety, and I chose 16 years ago to live at a peaceful place. Uh, we experienced an incident in the first weekend of April in which a uh, stolen golf cart uh, hit our mailbox twice and teens driving the, the golf cart ran away. Uh, we didn't know what happened because we'd never been contacted by any detective, despite we, we pressed charges. So we would like, first of all, we would like to know what is going on with this in investigation. I contact the, um, the investigation department. I couldn't speak with any detective. And today I request the, um, the, 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 the form that we, the, the, the chart that we made. Uh, to have a copy of that. Um, and but uh, after that, every weekend on security situation of the village green was uh, until it escalated to the very serious event that we are talking about uh, of the citizen that was physically and seriously assaulted. I would like as a citizen uh, of this uh, community know what is going to be done regarding this horrible crime and how its security will be improved because security should be our priority here uh, and it's getting worse and, and it's getting out of control in this moment. As a solution, I propose um, that maybe we can use portable surveillance cameras such as the ones that are in the VR coverage so that the police department can monitor and send of the officers when necessary. The cameras should be three, for example, one in the entrance to control the entrance and exit or from the island, another in the village green, and another maybe in CVS, which is another point of concentration of the teenagers. Um, another solution could be lower the, queue, the curfew hours for teenagers and Police should be enforced uh, and control this uh, this curfew that is uh, done. And um, I also would like to those who commit crimes to start receiving charges, or their parents if they are minors. So maybe in that way they will start to end the existing impunity that uh, when community a crime here in the in the island. I hope that all together we can find a solution to this complicated uh, situation that we are facing here right now in, in our community. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have no other callers lined up. Okay. Um, next. Let's go to the next item. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is the agenda. Approvals, deferrals, additions, deletions, substitutions, and withdrawals. Okay. Um, Council Member Laredo, you have an item? There you go, sorry. Yes, I would like to, uh, if you like, uh, 11B6, the report by Vice Mayor London on the manager's uh, outline of the contract to be moved to number one. I second that. Okay. And, uh, and second, in light of uh, what's happened in the last few weeks and this Saturday, I would like to have a short discussion added on the section, same section on crime and vandalism so we can exchange. Views. So that would be 11B7. Yes, sir. 11B7. I think we may get to that conversation with the manager's report, but okay. you know. Let's I'd put it there just in case. Yeah, I agree. Th okay. There was something that I don't know if it's out of order that the lady uh, talked about the black flashing lights that turning to right. I don't know when it's appropriate. I guess you were coming in. You know the flashing lights people are going by yeah and several several times i mean on many times uh, without making it or i've suggested the administration to put red lights there and i told them that i have proof a in key west and second on brickell avenue well we can and have that conversation if you want to have eight. that as part of seven or eight say eight please thank you 
crimes and vandalism. Well, crimes. And then eight would be the flash. The red light on the flashlight, yeah. Flashing lights. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to amend. Um, I wanted to amend uh, the mayor's B. It, it was B5. I guess it's moved to B6. Appointments. I would like um, the advice of council on appointments to advisory boards. Um, Councilmember Laredo has made some comments, and I, I, I've heard other similar comments from other residents, but I'd like to get all of the council to weigh in because I think if we're going to make a sea change in our boards, I want everybody on council on board on that. I think it's an important issue. Um, so I want all of your, so it's, it's not going to be appointments today. I do have some positions, but I want to hold off until we have a, a, a full okay. frank discussion. So it will be a discussion on appointments to advisory boards. That's my amendment okay. to that. Rather than appointments. Rather than appointments okay. tonight. Okay. Um, anybody else? Point uh, 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 deletions, uh, uh, additions. Mr. Manager, do you have anything to add or delete? No, sir. I will be speaking on the uh, police issue. I as assume. Part of my manager's report. Correct. Okay. Moved as amended. I th okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Okay. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is a special presentation by Fausto Gomez with the Key Biscayne Condominium President's Council. Mr. Gomez, are you here? I, I am here, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Fausto Gomez, 765 Crandon Boulevard, Penthouse 10. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, Council Members. I appreciate your inviting me to speak this evening about the reinvigorated and reimagined Key Biscayne Condominium President's Council. First, however, I would like to express our appreciation to all of you for their beach renourishment program. And many thanks for adding an additional amount to the state and local dollars originally allocated to the effort. The beaches are now broad and the dunes which are the first line of defense for beachfront properties in a hurricane have been restored. Thank you. COVID has up upended all our lives and organizations and the president's council is no exception. After a period of limited activity because of the pandemic, early this month, I was elected president along with Richard Michelson from the Towers of Key Biscayne as treasurer, Diana Garmendia from Casa del Mar as secretary Tony Camejo from Key Colony as Vice President, and Michelle Estevez continues as Executive Director. I understand that some of my colleagues are also present on Zoom this evening. Our charter is to represent the owners and residents of multifamily properties, but the board and I support a more expansive view. While working to enhance the quality of life of condominium residents and the value of our homes, we are also cognizant of Key Biscayne as a whole and the needs of the overall community. We view our organization as analogous to the Coral Gables Homeowners Association, the South Miami Homeowners Association, or similar groups. We will serve as the unified voice of the multifamily property, but always keeping in mind that balkanization does not benefit anyone. To that end, we have established a preliminary work program which we believe is good for all of Key Biscayne. With your support and that of other Key Biscayne organizations, we are proposing to organize a community-wide workshop on property insurance by inviting state policy leaders and key interest groups to provide insight on the market, policy initiatives, and suggestions on how to reduce premiums or the creation of alternative insurance vehicles. The condominiums are facing rate increases between 28 and 35%, and the single family homes are also slated for significant increases. This is an issue of key importance. Let me repeat, this is an issue of key importance to all Key Biscayne, and we as a condominium president's council are taking the lead. We invite the village council to serve as co-host with us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we're gonna identify state financial support or cost-effective arrangements for retrofitting condominium parking garages for electric vehicles and for placing charging stations in public areas. I understand that some initial steps 
are, are being planned and have taken, but we must be prepared. The future is here and it is now with regards to electric vehicles. Third, we're gonna examine the viability of establishing a centralized parking staging area for contractors and vendors in order not to overburden the limited facilities at condominiums and equally important Key Biscayne's road capacity. Later this week, I will be meeting with the leadership of Bill Back State Park for this purpose. And let me pause to give a shout out to the Chamber of Commerce and Robert Zugalu, who have previously worked on this effort. Fourth, we'll discuss with the village and other parties the requirements that beach furniture be removed on a daily basis from designated areas behind beachfront property. The amount of effort and actual labor is immense, and it is a hidden financial obligation of beachfront condominium owners imposed by government. Also, I have been told by village staff that the same is not required for commercial properties. I can't vouch for the veracity of that, but we look forward to engaging in fruitful discussion. Finally, we have one immediate ask. Stormwater has been at the forefront of the President's Council agenda, and we appreciate the rate study that was recently approved. We particularly thank Mayor Davey and Council Member Moss and Council Member Segurora for working on this. As you know, the multifamily properties contribute over $1.2 million, and the single family homes about $434,000 to the Stormwater Fund. And I think we can all agree that there is no equivalency in service. Without delving into the legality of providing public services on private properties or the expenditure of public funds for said purposes, we have one very simple suggestion. The village currently has a contract for the cleaning of catch basins and wells. According to your staff, the average cost of the village is $250 per cleaning. And your own data shows that on private properties, condominiums in particular, on Key Biscayne, there are 656 catch basins and 72 wells. And the President's Council information is that the average cost to clean those is $450. If the village would simply extend your contract so that the 728 catch basins and wells on private properties would be serviced at the same price that you pay, there would be an immediate, immediate cost savings to the multifamily residents of $145,600. The condominiums would pay for the service, but at the reduced rate the village is currently receiving. We ask for your action tonight and ask you to direct the administration to make this happen. In closing, my board and I pledge to you that our actions will always be positive, focused on enhancing the quality of life and the value of living on Key Biscayne, and that our solutions will be achievable, sustainable, and have a community-wide focus. My board and I are available to you. We look forward to working with you and other Key Biscayne organizations as partners, and look forward to your consideration on the issues that we bring forward on behalf of our 34 member properties and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Fausto. Um, uh, Council Member McCormick had a question or a statement. Sure. No, I had a statement. Um, when we last upped our con or renewed our contract for our catch basins, we I know I specifically asked the vendor if they would extend the same pricing, and I was assured by the previous administration that they would make that happen. So it's sort of surprising to me to hear that. Well, maybe it shouldn't be, but. Yet it is surprising that they didn't execute that. So I'm sorry to hear that. And um, I do hope we can move on that because I thought that was already in place. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Next item. Mike. Mike. Okay, I'm sorry. Council Member Moss and then Council Member Laredo. If we're going to have comments. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, uh, Council Member McCormick because we brought this up in October and we did give direction to our administration to ensure that they can talk to our vendor and give the same pricing so they can bulk it. So again, and I was surprised to hear this uh, by Fausto. And I think, you know, not to speak for my fellow council members, but I think that we would all be in support uh, to uh, have a piggyback 
uh, cost to all of the multifamily. Okay, Councilmember Laredo, you're 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 muted. I muted you when you were coughing. It's sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. No. Yes, I support uh, what Dr. Uh, uh, Fausto said, and uh, what uh, counter my support. Uh, the three of you have been very involved, and thank you for being involved. I just wanted to congratulate Fausto briefly on his election, although. A lot of people regretfully did not see Diane Garmendia get elected president, both because uh, the intelligence, level of intelligence and the aesthetics she would bring to, to your group. But uh, as a second choice, you're not bad, Faust. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Commissioner. I mean, Councilman Lauder. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank you all. Fausto, we'll be talking. Thank you, Mayor. Next item. Next item is a special presentation by Chief Resilience and Sustainability Officer, Dr. Roland Samimi on seaweed management options for the village of Key Biscayne. Doctor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, happy to know that most folks are enjoying the new beach. Um, being that we have a new beach, I thought it would be a good time to maybe consider some different options that um, might be available to us for dealing with the seaweed issue that um, is an ongoing challenge and will become even more so in time. I'm just trying to figure out here how to share my screen. So bear with me for just a second because I do have a few slides. I want to run through them kind of quickly. We do have a long agenda, it seems. So I'm not going to take Dr. Too so much maybe time. While, while you do that, I just want to congratulate you. Uh, and your staff and the contractor for getting this done uh, with well. quality and within the, I believe it's on, on schedule yeah. and on budget. And you know, this island has the tendency not to thank and recognize good stuff. And this is great uh, what you all done. And I think I speak for uh, both of the, uh, all of our council here that uh, congratulations on the beach. Well, Absolutely. that's greatly appreciated. I, I, I thank you for that. Um, it is on time, it is on schedule, on budget. Um, we will make it by uh, by the start of turtle nesting season. In fact, they're just working on the last bits of restoring the beach access paths at Oceana. Otherwise, um, the beach is complete. So fundamentally, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, you guys do know uh, the severity of the seaweed situation at times. Um, I do want to just reiterate <laughs> some of the challenges that we face in trying to strike a balance relative to how we deal with seaweed. We've got cost constraints, space constraints, um, residents' expectations of how they'd like to see the beach um, for recreating, high accumulation periods during the year, uh, bacteria considerations that we learned about from the work that Dr. Uh, Solo Gabriel from University of Miami did for us, odor issues, plastic trash issues, potential sand loss from raking and hauling seaweed, time to rake, aesthetics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that said, I also thought it would be important to have some reference points uh, for the discussion of options. This is Bill Baggs on an average day. Bill Baggs does not do anything in terms of seaweed management other than leave what accumulates onto the beach on the beach and lets nature sort of take its course. Some of it goes out with the tide, some of it dries up, some of it decomposes, some of it blows into the dunes. But fundamentally, based on um, eyeballs on the ground for much longer than mine have been in the village, um, this is sort of what the beach looks like on average at Bill Bags. No seaweed management. Should we ever choose to not do seaweed management during portions of the year where there's lighter accumulations? This is sort of a light type accumulation that you might find on the beach. Um, it is uh, raked uh, seven days a week. Uh, and what we previously used to do is integrated in the top six inches of the beach, sand, berm, at the rack line. And that we learned was not such a ideal practice because of the promotion of bacteria growth. This is a moderate to heavy <laughs> sort of accumulation that we would try and rake and integrate into the top six inches. Um, obviously, as you get more accumulation, it becomes 
less and less able to be integrated and results in this sort of level of management. Finally, we have the heaviest accumulations during the year where it's just uh, impassable and, um, and it has to be raked, it has to be mounded because we have no space to stage yet and it then is hauled off on an ad hoc basis, sort of like special service type approach, uh, which tends to result in relatively high um, trucking costs because they're not, uh, the prices are not negotiated in advance. So that being said, here's part of what we face um, this year. This is uh, from the University of South Florida Optical Oceanography Lab. It's a satellite based tracking system for sargassum in the Caribbean basin. Here's 2020, which was last summer, a relatively um, relatively decent amount of accumulation last summer. Um, this is March 2021 compared, oh, sorry, I don't know why that happened. This is March 2021 compared to March 2020. As you see, Sorry. there's a higher level of sargassum in the Caribbean Sea that is likely going to be influencing us in the next few months, primarily May, June, July, August, June, July, August, something like that. So when we look at the various options that we came up with, um, the special service hauling this year is going to be uh, higher than what we saw last year to take into consideration the fact that we might be getting more uh, seaweed from the Caribbean basin. So st first option that we have is basically status quo. All of these involve seven day a week service, collecting trash, sifting and grooming the upper beach. Okay. How they vary is whether you rake and integrate, which we have learned is not an, a good way to go, or whether you rake and then deep bury it three feet down, or whether you rake and haul. Um, and so each one of these options has essentially um, a, a slightly higher uh, relative percent cost <coughs> compared to 2020. If we were to go to seven days a week and a special service of uh, hauling during the high seaweed season and we deep bury as opposed to do six inches integration, uh, we're talking about a 20% increase over last year. Um, if we do um, a situation where four months out of the year when the seaweed accumulation is light, and we just leave it on the beach uh, versus uh, we make provisions for three trucks a day on average um, and we haul uh, that much volume eight months out of the year and the excess gets buried three feet into the, into the, um, the intertidal zone. That represents essentially a 37% increase over last year. Option number four, which is similar to what the city of Hollywood does, is, um, is essentially they <clears throat> rake and they haul the weed line two trucks per day year round. If they have more than two trucks per day, they bury the excess three feet deep. And that would be essentially 40% over what we did in 2020. Um, bearing in mind that these hauling options don't um, reflect the possibility of staging on Virginia Key, which is something that we're working on right now with uh, Commissioner Regalado, which would enable essentially the um, seaweed to be dried and the weight and the volume reduced. And we're also considering doing a composting pilot whereby we're using some of the seaweed to be composted and then made available to the village for use around the municipal properties and for also use around Miami-Dade County, therefore reducing the amount of seaweed that we have to take to a landfill. So these, these relative percent differences can vary depending on the degree to which we have access for Virginia Key. Uh, we have also an option where we could just rake and haul year round with no barrier or integration and that has 
uh, a requirement of a staging area in Virginia Key. That's 50% over what we uh, what we spent last year. And then and then lastly, we have Rankin Hall all the time, and we have no staging on Virginia Key, and we do no burial and no integration. It's just Rankin Hall, and that's basically 66% over what we spent last year. Fundamentally, some some made some 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 foundational points for consideration is that the bacteria data that UM generated refutes the integration into the top six inches of the beach as, as a valid approach to the bacteria problem. The sargassum accumulation in 2021 is likely to be higher in 2020, <coughs> so we have to take that into consideration. We might actually have to haul more than we did last year. Hollywood, Broward County, Palm Beach County, they haul and, um, and deep bury. Uh, relatively successfully, and trucking prices are better negotiated well in advance, and expectations is going to be <coughs> critical for the community to be satisfied. Um, ultimately, it's a balancing act of, of cost, how much seaweed ends up on the beach, and how much you bury. Uh, In-water options were not uh, included in this because um, in the conversations that I had with with the DEP and with Derm and with FWC, um, that seems like a relatively challenging road to travel um, from a permitting <coughs> point of view and a cost point of view. Um, Monroe County does do some barrier type work um, and, and and removal of seaweed uh, from the mouths of canals so that they avoid seaweed getting pushed up into there. And I have a call in to the uh, the chief resilience officer from Monroe County to sort of see what their experience is with this, but fundamentally, where we're focused on land side options, and with that in mind, um, I'm available to answer any any questions that you may have. Yeah, uh, Roland, I've got a few. Um, so, w walking through this, it looks like I mean. The, the integration that's out, right? We've, we've, we've pretty much, that's out. There, there's no, yeah, six, pretty, we're, we're not going to do that yeah. anymore. We all know it's bad. Um, it doesn't really help with the problem. Um, so what we seem to be looking at, we've got two, two ideas, right? We can either deep bury or we haul everything. Is that right? Right. Or, and, but <laughs> we can also, we can also leave a certain amount of seaweed on the beach. Right. And leave a certain amount. And I guess that's my question. The distinctions between two, three and four um, cause four is more expensive than three, but three has three trucks a day. Whereas four has two trucks a day. Um, right. why is that? Well, Any ideas? Yeah, because four is basically your year round. I got service. you. All right. The other one's eight so, years. So you're, I, trying, you're basically understood. trying to keep the accumulation at a lower level requiring fewer right. trucks per day. Got and it. then three you have a period of the year where it's super intense, where super you, intense. Right, got it. So you need, you need more trucks. No, you've answered my question. You've answered my question there. All right. So, I mean, optimally, well, I, I think if we can get this done with, with Virginia key, if we can get that, that WASD piece to, to sure. fit in, I think we could, we could be looking pretty good. Um, yeah. That's an agenda item that's going to the County commissioners right. meeting in May. Right. Um, and so I've been we'll working with the assistant city of uh, County attorney and with the director of WASD uh, to answer their questions for that language to be developed. Awesome. Uh, Councilmember Moss, I see you raise your hand. Councilmember McCormick and then Councilmember Segarola. I think from a uh, policy perspective, I think what you're looking from us is what, what the expectations that we want to set for our right. beach. Uh, um, you know, I can tell you at least from sitting with you, Roland, uh, the other day going through this presentation and uh, looking at the photographs, I'm okay with seaweed on the beach as long as it's manageable. I mean, if you can get to the water and back without having to, to step on, you know, either walk through the seaweed or be able to hop over because it's just a thin line, I mean, it's natural. Uh, but if it's to the point where you have to start walking on top of it, you have no choice, I think it's a, a, a big issue. Um, and I think we also, I, I like the idea of the, the shifting of the season. So you have certain seasons that are much lighter. We may only need to rake you know, I don't know the numbers. I'm just throwing stuff out there, but maybe the raking happened once a week on those on those very light months, and then on the heavy months, they're two or three times a day. I have no idea, but um, I like the idea that you know I don't like the idea that people are just out there raking 
because we just set a, uh, a standard number and there's really nothing much to rake out there and we're spending money. And then when we really need the raking to happen, they can't even catch up and we have to throw more money into it. So I think that's also important. The deep burying, um, again, I, I know I asked a question a little bit. I don't know what the pros are con and cons are over long term because when you keep burying the stuff underneath, it's not magically disappearing. It's kind of like that, you know, just put it under my bed and I don't have to do my laundry and then, but it's still there, you know? It's, yeah, it's but over, over away. time, so, over, over, over more time, it decomposes. Really about you, Brett, really. <laughs> I know, yeah. It, oh, it, yeah, it over time, it does decompose. So, I mean, but but the thing is, it's like how, over time, but, you know, how much of that stuff keeps coming in, is it faster than what, how fast it can decompose and that can that cause more problems down the road? It may not, I, you know, that's just a question that I have. Right. And then, you know, I know that we've all received some emails back and forth today about the in water. And yeah, I know that you, you have some issues about it, but it, but it seems like, you know, talking to you today and listening to you, it may not be fully explored. And it seems like the company says that they do it and they can sit with you. So I, I would still like that we maybe explore that as an option just to see what it is, you know, what the cost is. Is it really what, you know, they're saying it's not a big issue with the state and you're saying it maybe is. So I think that you guys may need to get together and, and talk through it a little bit more because if there is something else that we could do, even if it's not all the time, if it's some of the part of the time, it, it could be part of the solution, which could, could be helpful. So I'm, I'm open to that as well. Um, but we definitely can't let it get to a point where you know that 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 integration is horrible. I, I can't stand doing that. So so I'm glad right. that you put this together. Thank you, Councilmember McCormick, and then Councilmember Segarola. Um, thank you so much, Roland, for this. Um, and I I feel like I have a pretty good understanding. I you were really patient with me, and we talked through it a lot. But I I thought it might be important for people watching at home to ask some of the questions that I asked of you. Um, one is if you could talk a little bit about why we're not worried about concerns with the bacteria with the deep burying versus the six inches and um if that yeah. first if you could do that yeah yeah that's that's primarily because there's enough sediment on top of the seaweed that's decomposing that you don't really engage with the bacteria that might be growing in the decomposing seaweed at depth and you are you're avoiding the tide from being able to wash up into that decomposing seaweed and grabbing the bacteria and bringing it back into the water. Okay, thank you. And then the other, um, it sounds to me just sort of a summation of what I got from your presentation is that the, you know, like we keep saying with so many different aspects of living on Key Biscayne that times are changing and that we're seeing this massive sargassum bloom headed our way and that we certainly have to try to adjust our expectations a little bit. I think in terms of how much seaweed we're willing to live with on the beach as a community, but also how much we're willing to pay to keep the beach in a way that we can all still enjoy it, even if it does look a little bit more natural, as mm -hmm. we like to say now with seaweed. Um, if uh, we could also talk just a little bit about um, I think we're getting or we may already have a camera that eventually residents will be able to see to take a look at what the situation is on the beach. That, yeah, that, is, that is in out. place. That is in place. And Mike Fleming is in the process of working out the programming such that people will be able to go onto the village website and see like a live stream webcam of of the beach to see what kind of accumulations are are on the beach and choose to go or not go. Okay, I think that that's important for lots of different reasons. We could also decide whether to bring a, a paddleboard or a boogie board. Um, but basically, I think what we're looking at is for what you need from us as a council is a decision on how much we're willing to spend and how much we're willing to tolerate on the, on the beach. Is that right? Um, well, I mean that, but also whether or not we should just go to the, you know, request for proposal stage and lay this out in terms of, you know, uh, half a dozen different levels of service that we're looking right. for and have potential bidders then um, submit. Price it out for us. Yeah, and and one of the you know one of the one of the levels of service may be um, you know for those who can provide in water you know type service of 
of seaweed management before it gets onto the beach, then they should go ahead and price that out. And, and otherwise there's all these other land side options that are available, but I think it would be important to, to do the, the request for proposal process because then you can get all the different vendors to lay out their qualifications and lay out their, their services to other municipalities and lay out their costs for these right. various options. And then at that point, council, you know, weighs the, the pros and cons of each, uh, of each um, approach and cost. Okay. Councilmember Segarola. You're muted, I think. There we go. What I was going to say was basically that, that last point. I don't think we need to limit our options in any way at this point. Um, I'm for it. We're going to end up probably with a more complicated than usual RFP, but we should ask for each vendor to price out each and every one of these because price is always going to be a factor, but we might realize that the difference between one option and another just isn't that big, number one. And number two, we should, in addition to the seven options, I think we should even consider another option where certain months of the year, the winter months, where there's fewer seaweed and there's fewer demand for the beach, we do what Bill Bags does and just have no pickup at all. We could do it four or five months, six months, however many it is, and focus on the heavier months like that. We have the best of both worlds. We could have hauling every single day and just leave the beach naturally to recuperate and when there's not that much seaweed for the rest of the year. So it's going to be a complicated RFP, but let's ask for everything and see what happens. I think that's the right approach. Um, I, I think we haven't, you know, I obviously number one isn't going to work. We're not going to do the, the integration, but other than that, I think you know, let, let's let them all come to us with their ideas and, and then let's see what they have to say. One, one okay. question. Go ahead. Uh, Roland, just to, uh, I wasn't clear on something on the in water um, methodology. Was the discourse today that we all noted about efficacy or was it about permitting requirements or what was it about? Well, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a combination of, of both. Um, you know, depending on where you're operating in the world, you may have more ability to do things than in other places. Um, you know, there, I've been approached by a number of vendors over the past year since I started regarding the concept of deploying barriers the way they do in Mexico and the Dominican Republic and other countries um, in order to keep the weed from getting onto the beach. And then, and then a boat would then essentially skim that weed, collect that weed, and then dispose of it land side. Um, you know, every, every, every vendor might have its own sort of special way of doing it. Um, some of it may be more feasible and more cost effective than others. Some of it may be permittable, some of it may not be permittable. I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a municipality that I know of or that, uh, that the DEP person that I spoke to knows of that has deployed barriers on a municipal scale to keep seaweed off the beach. And then the question also then becomes, well, what happens to the areas that don't have barriers deployed? If you could get DERM and or DEP or FWC to allow you to do that. Um, so, so, you know, whereas there might be vendors out there that would like to try and get it out of the water before it comes onto the beach, if they think that they can do it, then we have that as part of the RFP and they can, throw their hat in the ring and they can, you know, explain, you know, in detail as to how they believe they could get that done and why they believe they could get the, the DEP and the Durham folks and the FWC folks to accept it and what the cost would be. And then, and then that's the point of, of data that the council has to consider. And, and efficacy. Sure. It's, it's setting expectations is, is correct, but, um, from, from our briefing, it seems to me that we've come to recognize that the nature of the problem that we're dealing with has, has changed. It's worsened. And so, you know, our resources and response needs to change commensurately. Yeah, it, it's, it's coming at us. There's nothing you see from the, the, the radar that there was. I don't know, I guess that was radar. Um, 
it's worse this March than it has been in several years. I mean, I think 2018, was that our worst year? 2018, Since, yeah, 2018 was the worst yeah. in March. And, and, but I, well, but I mean, you look at, and then look how it went subsequently. So I would assume that now April, May, you're going to see more. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Uh, seawater, the, the ocean is hot, is warmer. This stuff grows. We've got the effluents coming off of the islands, coming off of Africa, coming off of South America that feeds this stuff. So we, we've got to be ready to deal with it. We, we can't, unfortunately, we can't stop it at the source. So we've got to deal with the end product. Um, but I think having the, the RFP contain a number of opportunities for us to review and it will get input from our citizens as to what do they want? Because I think that that's, you know, there, there's, there's a balance there, right? There, there may be people who don't mind seaweed, but there are people who do not want to step on three feet of rotting vegetation in order to get in the water. It's not pleasant. Ignacio's observation is correct. There are times when, you know, you know, it's not perhaps arguably necessary to ensure a pristine condition all the time. Correct. Because sometimes it's just innocuous. But it's other the times, ocean. you can't you can't even go down there. Correct. So the, what, I, the only... what I would what I would like to say is that in the immediate future, what we've done because we have more sand on the beach now, and it has given us a little bit more flexibility, is I have told our beach contractor. Um, not to integrate into the top six inches. Right. And what we're doing is we're doing the deep burial to three feet to sort of monitor how that's working out. Okay. And and I am still aggressively, as you, as with you, with you, Mayor Davey, aggressively pursuing, <coughs> excuse me, Virginia Key, right. so that we can at least get some staging right. to maybe um, ease some of the pressure uh, when it comes time to haul. Because we are going to have to haul. There's no and question. All of this is going to have to be done before I believe we have an RFP out on the street and we have responses to the RFPs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so these are things that are already underway, and we're going to continue with that approach um, until we have an RFP with all different options, and then we go through the whole procurement process and whatnot. Great. All right. Are you are you planning on including in the RFP? the variable of either Virginia Key or the South Dade landfill and have them. And I'll have, have in, yeah, I will, I will have more clarity on that after, um, uh, after, the, May, after the BCC meeting. Um, yeah, is able to talk to the county commission. Go ahead, okay. Councilmember Segarella. No, you got on mute again. Um, when would, well, taking into account that you have to wait until the May county meeting, when do you think you, we could have the RFP for review, I guess after that meeting or soon or later. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and speak directly to the folks in procurement uh, this week. Now that we're through this discussion and figure out what that what that process. Yeah, is I think that's that. a constant. I mean, I don't I don't think Virginia Key necessarily precludes us from starting an RFP because we can just add that in. We can make two right. assumptions, right? We can say we got that staging area and we didn't get that staging area. And right. then the opportunity for potentially composting, that's something we've been working on for a while. And that, if that comes down the road, that's that's another bump up. Right. Right. So, so it, I'm going to start immediately. I, I guess the direction is to not be afraid of making a very complicated RFP. Correct. No, let's make yeah. one. Right. That's right. I'm going to get on with it straight away. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next item. Okay. Next item is a special presentation by Fire Rescue Chief Eric Lang on emergency debris management. Good evening, Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, the last time I was here speaking with you was June of 2019. Uh, that was uh, about the same time. Um, I guess we're a little a bit early. As you remember that currently hurricane season runs from June 1st to November 30th. And uh, I think, you know, we had a pretty busy year when it comes to emergency management. Uh, that was how, especially early on, that we were operating in the COVID emergency and during this pandemic. Uh, it's been one of the busiest years that I ever remember, uh, definitely since the start of the village. Um, the directors, we've all met, uh, and I'm gonna share a screen I'm gonna try to see if I can follow along with what uh, uh, Dr. Samimi did, if that's okay. And bear with me just one second. I think 
that's it. Can you can you all see that? Yep. All right. So uh, so we met as as a group uh, under Chief Preston's direction, uh, and we discussed the roles that needed to be filled, and uh, we talked about training that needs to occur and the plans that need to be made. And over on the right hand side of this slide is all the positions that need to uh, be filled when we're operating. And if those positions aren't filled, somebody has to assume that role. And depending on the size of the emergency, the, the more people it takes to, to run it. Uh, this is what typically looks like in a hurricane or a hurricane response. And uh, up at the top uh, between the manager and uh, the fire and police chief, depending on the type of incident, uh, that's who fills that unified command role. Many of you are familiar with this because we've seen it. Uh, and uh, and I can, I'm here to assure you uh, and along, on, on behalf of the staff that as a village, as departments, uh, that we are ready. Uh, back in 2006, uh, some of you may have uh, remembered, in, in April, we adopted the National Incident Management System, and that's what this is. And so uh, it's important to know that it takes a lot of people to fill these roles, unfortunately. The sun is out, it's shining, it was a beautiful spring that we're having right now, uh, and we're in this preparedness phase, no different than uh, what uh, Dr. Samimi was just doing, talking about how we're gonna prepare for the seaweed, well, we're always preparing in that emergency management role, specifically for hurricanes right now. And essentially what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of walk you through what happens uh, in response to a hurricane. And I'm also uh, gonna have a little bit of a, of a focus on debris management. So some of you remember this, probably enjoying your Labor Day uh, back in 2017, I see some smiles and uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the long weekend got uh, a little, uh, dimmed by uh, this thing, uh, this hurricane called Irma that was brewing out there like a monster. Uh, way offshore, uh, it was a, a, a category five storm and uh, it, was, it was coming on strong. Um, kind of a look into last year, uh, we had 30 named storms. We went into the Greek alphabet. It was the busiest on record. And, um, and, and you know, they're, they're looking at a, a pretty busy year, but you never know. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a plan that we live by when it comes to emergency management. It's called the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. Uh, we adopted this in, in uh, 2018. And, uh, and essentially we go through a, a timeline where we do an EOC activation, we have some meetings, we declare a local state of emergency, we create that team, which was that org chart you so, saw, and we have an objective driven incident. Um, where we go, we, we monitor what the watches and the warnings are, and we, uh, we, we try to keep the community informed. Early on, it's one of the biggest things that we do. Uh, there's a picture where, where I think we made CNN news. Uh, they were, and you know, we were getting a lot of attention as uh, this was back in Irma when it was approaching. We reach out and we do this well in advance to our, what I call our disaster partners. And, uh, and, and who's joining us today is uh, Ashprit, is also on the call, Matt Girden, who is, uh, one of our reps has worked with us for many years, very familiar with Key Biscayne. Uh, we work very closely with City of Miami, City of Miami Fire Rescue, the County Emergency Management, and, and some of the retailers uh, that are out here that keep you know the infrastructure working, grocery stores, prescriptions filled, uh, gas stations, uh, and of course, uh, our friends over at the Key Biscayne Foundation that, in my opinion, we really lever to get to execute our operations. Uh, they're, they're always willing to lend a helping hand. So we go through this evacuation uh, back in 2017, we evacuated to uh, a hotel off Island. Uh, those of you who joined us, you remember us losing power over there. And uh, I believe we've addressed that problems in our preparation phase where they've uh, fortified their generators uh, and uh, actually made it a little bit more comfortable for us to run uh, our, our off Island emergency operations center, if you will. Uh, but a mandatory evacuation, I want to stress, and we've talked a lot about this, is a mandatory evacuation. The county mayor gives the mandatory evacuation, and it's our responsibility to enforce that. And we did. We, we also evacuated. And uh, it's, it's an important message for us to continue to share. After the storm passes, and that was a long one, if you remember, uh, we go through this reentry and we move into this response phase. The response is all about search and rescue. Uh, this happens to be pictures of the Florida, uh, South Florida Urban Search and Rescue Team. It's called Task Force Two. Uh, we have uh, a number of members of our members that are part of this team 
that go out the door uh, and are, are, are actively engaged in the response. And so that's, they're an asset to us. And uh, I frequently talk to them when need be. Uh, as we're making our re-entry, uh, we're doing a damage assessment and we're determining how much search and rescue actually needs to be done. But our first mission is uh, to address any uh, possible risk to life, 911 calls that have been holding. And part of our damage assessment, I'll be reaching out to my, my good friend, Dr. Sermimi, the waterman, and, uh, and, and talking about environmental impacts on the beach. We'll be assessing the bridge. If you remember back in 2019, um, Frank Rollison, the emergency management director, we have a plan with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that, and the county that we have the ability to, to execute a plan to bring in a floating bridge. That presentation was made. And the big thing here I want to talk to you about is debris management. Uh, just to control expectations a little bit, if you can kind of look through this picture and the words, there's a big pile of debris with trucks and grappling hooks. And I had mentioned to you some sites that we have used before. And that right there is an early picture, if you will, a number of years ago, pre-17-ish, 16-ish of the Village Green. So we previously had used some parks, uh, specifically Cranon Park, and that's no longer available to us. We've worked with the city of Miami. We've worked with Miami-Dade County. Uh, we've reached out to our other partners and we continue to look for sites for us to have a debris staging site. What I wanted to bring to your attention is just to, uh, to manage expectations is at this time, this is our only site that we can guarantee that we have. So what does that mean? This is a little bit, I got this picture from Todd on the left, beautiful fields. We know what that looks like. If we don't have a staging site that we can secure. Uh, we end up having to make about a 60 minute, uh, depending on traffic, of course, uh, one way down to the landfill in Miami County in, in, in South Dade. Uh, it says 44 minutes on the map. Whenever I pulled this up, it was probably during the day. Uh, and it's gonna take more trucks to get this job done. Uh, it could delay the process. And uh, those of you who remember back during Irma, uh, debris management was a very big deal um, and we, we spent a lot of time addressing that. I feel confident with the contract that we have in place. I feel confident with our, our vendors. Um, and back to Irma, we were able to clear all the debris within 30 days. Uh, the, the, the recommendation is that we, we do permit, if you will, the Village Green as our temporary debris staging site, and we continue to work with uh, finding other sites, and I assure you we will. And uh, Todd uh, in recreation, uh, working with the parks departments, uh, Jake uh, in BZP, uh, the manager's office, and Chief Press, if you recall, had a little bit of experience with debris during Irma. Uh, so we've been working on that. So uh, just wanted to make sure you have a visual of that. We know how important FPNL is, and I think the last time I was up here, you remember me talking about power, uh, and that's that's always critical. We have an amazing relationship with them, and they jump on uh, our our needs, if you will, to us to restore our power. Um, recovery, once we go into the recovery component, uh, we talk about getting our power back on, picking up our debris, getting our streets clean back, uh, getting our back to normal, if you will. Um, uh, if you remember these big tandem trucks that were driving around, um, just want to give you a visual. I, I don't know how easy it's going to be for these big tandem trucks to go to South Dade. So the equipment may have to adjust depending on our, our, our needs and if we actually have uh, a, a temporary debris staging site. Um, just a little bit of a timeline, you know, managing expectations. There's always the preparation for the storm. Uh, if it's a hurricane and we're under an evacuation order, we evacuate. Uh, there's time to push and clear the roadways and there's a, a potentially long period of time to, to pick up debris. And our goal is to, to get this community cleaned up as quickly as possible. Uh, this is a, uh, COOP is what we call it, continuity of operation plans. In business, it's called a business continuity plan. Um, and I think we've executed that pretty well in trying to assure uh, during this pandemic that we've been able to continue offering our services. So that's part of our, our SEMP, that uh, comprehensive emergency management plan. And this was uh, kind of a, a, a thank you, if you will, uh, to you, but this, these were signs that the community made up after we responded to Irma. Uh, so I thank you for your time. I'm available. Myself and staff are, are available for questions. Thank you, Chief. Anybody have any questions? I'm really hoping we 
don't uh, discuss this so it doesn't happen this year. But I appreciate your preparation. I know uh, I know you guys are ready. Um, so let's just hope that uh, we don't have to deal with it this year. I just oh, have a quick uh, council member question. Ross? So you're saying that we we don't have any place field uh, except the village green really to use. Um, have we reached out to some of our uh, own neighbors inside inside Key Biscayne, like the field at um, at uh, St. Agnes or something like that? I mean, obviously anything that got destroyed we would have to put in back new. Um, or if not, if that is not a, an option, maybe looking into Miami, looking at Virginia Key, uh, other options. But I was hoping that maybe somebody on the island that has some space would allow us to use it because nobody's going at to, at that time that that's happening, nobody's using, nobody's playing soccer or anything. I mean, we're trying to clean up. And obviously there's FEMA money that's going to come in and reimburse any damages that happen while we're cleaning. And, um, you know, and, you know, I'm not sure if you reached out to any of these, uh, uh, groups. So uh, thank you, council member, for that question. Uh, we, the first thing we did is we, we looked at all of the possible places within the island, within the village, St. Agnes, uh, Crossbridge Church, uh, even the, consider the beach club, that they're logistically, they don't work very well. Uh, there needs to be a, a buffer between for space and uh, in being able to chip or reduce the material down. Uh, depending on the type of uh, chipper that we get. Um, it needs anywhere between 100 and 150 to 300 feet. As a safety zone, you have to have trucks access to be able to come in and out. Um, I, I, so we've looked at options, but I don't think many of them are viable. Uh, we've talked with the city of Miami. We talked, we're reaching out to the Virginia Key Beach Trust. Uh, we talked with Miami-Dade County. And we will continue those conversations, I guarantee you, up until the last minute. And I also think that because everybody's in the same boat, for lack of a better description, that there may be some things that occur very close to the emergency, if you will, uh, to, to facilitate opening of some other potential sites. So uh, I assure you we're exhausting all our options. Thank you. Sorry, Councilmember Laredo. Yeah, I, 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 where are you? I got you. There you go. You're muted. Thank You're you. unmuted. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm troubled by uh, your answer to Moss. Uh, the, the, having been on the Public Service Commission with uh, Andrews came in, uh, there there is no time. You uh, you you have to tie down something, Chief. Uh, now, not uh, not just before the season. Uh, cross cross bridge, cross bridge may not be perfect, but this is not about perfect. And as you know, we compensated them for their uh, willingness to help us uh, last time. So I, I might have, I might have misunderstood your answer, but uh, and I might have misunderstood Moss's concern. But if you are, you know, they were so we're consulting and we're exploring are not words that are very concrete to me as okay. it relates to this. So specifically, uh, the Crossbridge parking lot is not ideal in any way for us to set up a debris staging site. So it's, uh, it's, it's really not, it's not very feasible for us. And, and the Village Green is really the only feasible site within the Village See, I don't understand ideal or feasible. Could you translate that for me? Sure. Uh, so when I say logistics, I mean, trucks being able to drive into the property dump if you will and then and then drive out uh and have heavy equipment working on the property to pile up the debris and ultimately move in the chipper which is the if you can imagine a tree trimming truck that pulls up in the front yard or fpnl sometimes have them uh where they they reduce their debris down into the back of a truck well, imagine reducing, you know, 50,000 cubic yards into uh, and then loading that back up into a truck. There's logistics. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts to this and there's not enough entries in and there's not enough entries out. Uh, a possibility might be using, you know, St. Agnes Church uh, field and the Crossbridge Church parking lot. Uh, th but again, those are, you know, those are two partners of coming together 
And so, but again, it's, it's, not, it's less than ideal. Uh, and the reason that I'm here talking about the Village Green is because it's really our only feasible option. And the restore, uh, and the, really the thing about this is everything gets to restore back to original. Something I did talk to Todd about is, is we we're about four years into an, uh, roughly an eight year uh, uh, lifespan for the field on the Village Green. So maybe with some luck, we're not gonna get anything this year. Uh, and, but if we did have to use the Village Green, we're, you know, we're, you're aware and we would be using it. it it would, we would make it work, and and uh, and and that's that's the best thing that we have. If we chose not to do that, and we couldn't find, we couldn't get with the county or county parks, which doesn't seem like it's realistic for us to get to, uh, then then we have to do what they call that direct. Call. M Matt, for, who's on the phone with us, told me that we should be okay uh, with with adding more trucks, but. We know what we had experienced last time and trucks right. hauling was a pretty big deal. So I'm I'm also here to manage expectations. Okay. Council Chief. member Segarola. Chief Lang, um, it occurs to me that this might be the only actual useful thing that the entry block might be good for. Is that an option? Um, I talked about that with Matt as well. And, and you know, yes, you know, the idea of bringing trucks in and out. It, it doesn't really create a very large buffer zone. We can definitely take another look at it, but I, you know, we had talked about that as well, but as big as it looks, there's not as much space there. Right. I believe the village green and Todd can correct me is 10 acres as in totality. 9.8. All right. So sorry, I was off a little bit. Hey man, you uh, exaggerate. I can't, yeah. I gotta help you. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we, depending on how big our, our, our debris pile is, is how much we'd be using. And so if it's a small storm and we can't, and, you know, we don't want to direct all and, and the, that site becomes an option entry block, by all means, we, we will take advantage of it, but it really depends on the size of the debris field. Do you have to you have, have some to, sort of use contract in we place? Have, we have to have a, an approval from Durham and we can, we can. Um, get approval for multiple sites. That's acceptable. Is that something that can be discussed at this stage just to have the option later on to yeah. not do it at the last minute? I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a, a no brainer uh, for us. Uh, the, it just really has to do similar to the Crossbridge facility. It's, it's less than ideal. It's really not big enough for us. So we're, we're, we're really trying to be realistic in our, in our projection. Okay, thank you. Council member uh, Kaplan. I'm about Mastfield. That's, okay, uh, now you're getting the school district. So yeah, so schools, so kind of the, the pecking order of this, you, schools used to be leaned on pretty hard when it comes to hurricanes. But if you think of the height of hurricane season is September 11th, if uh, September 10th, if I'm not mistaken, which schools <coughs> in. So um, the application of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is getting, you know, back to the belonging, <coughs> if you will. And uh, we want our kids to get back to school. And they're very interested in, they're, they're very interested in opening the schools again. And when we, put, when we put debris on school fields, it doesn't work very well. And for what it's worth, the parks really felt as if they got, um, how should I say this? Um, um, too many dump trucks, if you will. And they, they weren't happy about becoming a, a dumping ground. And, and they, they basically said, you know, we can't, we're not built for this. And so many cities are having the same challenge, uh, especially in, in Miami-Dade County. Marine Stadium. Marine Stadium, City of Miami. And city of Miami, it's tough. That is, I assure you, one of my first conversations with the manager will be a manager to manager conversation with the City of Miami to look at, at options, but I, I've talked to their solid waste director and, and that's, that's where it, it really needs to be. Uh, I've, I've chief press and I have spoke about it. And if there's, um, you know, if, if chief press is meeting with the city of Miami manager, it's, it's a topic to be discussed. 
process. Uh, yeah, well, what's interesting is, you know, the, well, we, we, get it, we can go all sorts of rabbit holes. I mean, the waste, uh, the waste management plant, there's space behind that that could take, that the city of Miami is, is intending to use for storm, storm debris. I mean, maybe, we, you know, but I agree. Let, let's, when we get the, the manager situated, um, you all can have that conversation with the city of Miami. That, that's oh. not my screen, by the way. So no, I don't, I don't know what happened there. I don't know who that or whatever is. Whatever it is, we we got to get the we got to get the options ready, and we should probably have multiple options: one on the key, right. one in the middle, whatever it is. Because even if it's less than ideal, it still may be more ideal than trucking the stuff where you showed it on the map, and that would take two Correct. years to get clear. So I would rather go with the less ideal option, and or even tear up something that we have to replace just to get people back to normal as fast as we can. Agreed. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Next item. Next item, Mr. Mayor, is the consent agenda. Moved. Second. One typo on the April 6th. Uh, the word um, perimeter should be primer on page seven. You want to unmute? I'm sorry. I got you. Second. I can no, okay. apologize. Go ahead, Councilmember Loretta. No, I, I, there was a correction on the on the 15th as well that I phoned into the mat. The yes, clerk. I'm okay. going to make an adjustment under after item number four and the motion to select just a TR council member Kaplan sentence with the Mayor Davies suggested sentence. It's just flip uh, five. I, I think that would clarify. Jocelyn, I really don't understand what you just said. Oh, uh, I gave you the loan. If you would correct it, please. What was I it? Thought, I thought that you were going to do that. We've had several days on this. What was the, what was the reads, question? It reads, you brought up the issue of uh, that you're a person of you on a two-year contract, and then it's followed immediately by Kaplan made a motion to approve the above item. Oh, I see. Yeah. That, that, and and right. then motion by, the, you know, I didn't, you know, there was not discussion other than your comment, and I didn't second that. Right. Uh, no, nor, I think nor, the nor, motion to select. It's, it's just, it's, he, she needs to work the English there. Yeah. I was just okay. reversing the order of the two sentences. Got it. Understood. Clarify. All right. Thank you. I second. Second. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Next item. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is the second reading of an ordinance, a capital project authorizing ordinance of the village of Key Biscayne, Florida, selecting Critical Path Services, Inc. for the construction of a park located at 530 Crandon Boulevard and an amount not to exceed $1,387,374, providing for authorization, providing for implementation, and providing for an effective date. Moved. Move it. Second. I'm sorry, Mayor Davey moved it and who seconded? I think Frank did. No, Everybody. I actually, I actually moved no, it. No, Brett, you're slow, man. You're, on, a, you're, you're like a Brett. You're 30 seconds behind us. <laughs> So, Council Member Moss? He no, can I'm have it. Let's just, just go. Yeah. Okay. You call it, Jocelyn. We trust you. <laughs> All right. Um, I wanted to, on that, whether it can be a resolution, I would like for us to well, hold on. We've got, a, oh. we've got public hearing. We've got to no, open this for this, public comments. But before you move from uh, item one, because I don't know that would. Well, no, it's you, a second you, reading of an ordinance. Right. We just. Did we just vote on it? No, we haven't. We, we just moved it. It's open now, but I have to open for public comments. I apologize. No, that's right. Then we'll have our discussion. Is there anybody here who wants to talk? I have one raised hand in the audience. Mr. Mayor, I do have a caller with a raised hand and a phone <coughs> ending in 298. Caller, if you wish to speak, please dial star six on your telephone to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Melissa White, 370 Heather Lane. I'm calling regarding the anti-police rhetoric comments that were made earlier by a resident. I believe it was Louisa Conway with the Condominium President's Council. Okay? Right, um, hold on. This is, it's it, been a long... Wait, Melissa, sorry. This is not... This is about the, um, the, the 530. Oh, I've been... Not public comments. ...holding for an hour to make public comments. Sorry. Sorry. Um... Well, there, there's another, another public other comments coming up shortly. Yeah, we have another general one, right? Yes, we're, we're coming up right after this yeah. stuff. So we can call the question. 
Well, let's see if there's anybody oh. else. Sorry, Melissa. Mr. Mary, if no one else signed up to speak at the moment, um, would you like okay. me to read my script? I'm sorry. No, I, I think we're good. I, if there's nobody signed up, then then let's. This is call the call. Call the question. Has anybody got any comments, or are we going to call the question? I want to just. Uh, uh, before or after uh, okay. Council Member Larry, that, that within the next two meetings or so we come up uh, with a name so we stop calling at 530 and more importantly that I hope that we can make a resolution or a commitment that it shall not be named for any one individual just in case we've had this happen before uh, yeah. Yeah, and, I, I, uh, and I think, I think it's important and, and we should come up with a name it's not necessarily we need fun. to decide the name now but uh, it's, we, it's a big investment. We had to come up with a wonderful. Well, why don't we have a competition? I, I mean, let's I put thought, it up. Well, didn't we, when we put in like two councils ago, when we developed this plan and we put in the, these elements with the historic, um, the history of the village, that it, it was decided then that it be called Incorporation Park. If, oh, yeah. if, if that's not true or. No, uh, I don't should, remember that. No, well, it we was, weren't a council. It was prior to us. It was back. I just, I, I like words like serenity, or because this is a big investment, something like that. No, really, it's. Uh, well, it's, we should it's, find it's, out if it's been decided on and voted on before. At be, if you want to change it, you can still do that. I mean, but I was think, uh, an incorporation, but that's kind of a tacky name for a park. <laughs> I think. I'm, I think. I'm I, think it, I, it I think it was hold on. a contest. I, hold on. I like the the a contest. Floor. Yeah, I, I like. Hold I'm on. Brett, Brett was speaking, and then go oh, to okay. Councilmember Councilmember Moss no, and Councilmember. Just, Council just my my memory was that we we talked about Incorporation Park, but I don't think we made any vote or said that was going to be it. Okay. And I've heard it in many different, you know, civic park and stuff. But the idea, I think, that you guys that, that Councilmember Segarola is going to bring up, I think, is uh, uh, sounds like a good idea. Have yeah. a competition. Have the kids. Are you reading you know, his uh, mind? I, what well, is I would, he no, I heard about? him. I heard him saying that underneath his breath. So, I yeah. wouldn't. I wouldn't limit it just to the kids alone. I'd say Fine. any resident no, wants to fair. submit. Yeah. And would you accept as a friendly addition that it be named not after any individual? Yes. Yes. For sure. Yeah. No, no, Thank I, you. I agree with that. No. I, I, okay. I don't think that's an that's issue. All. So yeah. let the record reflect that. Let okay. the minutes reflect. Yeah, we have okay. no interest in naming it after an individual. Everybody good? One point. Council Member <laughs> Kaplan. The scope of work provides for a thousand feet of concrete. Could we spec permeable, whatever that, whatever that uh, drainable material is that's available now, and start taking steps to reduce impervious space if it's possible to do so and stay on budget? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I agree. I, and, and, and Frank, just so you know that when I looked at the plans, I couldn't find significant amount of concrete. It was more of this kind of like curb that you have to put under in order to, you know, stop the pavers and stuff like that too. So, yeah. um, but if they can, if they can use pervious for that portion to make it even more pervious, great. Right. Council member Segarola. I think it would be, I don't know if Todd or Jake are on the line that they could answer this, but I know this was one of the discussion items when we were talking about the sidewalks that we already know the exact price difference per square foot between regular concrete and, and, and that's trainable. Right. So it, would it just be a matter of increasing Math. the number on the, on the ordinance? And can we add that now or what do we, because I mean, I don't want to put it to another vote another day. Todd or Jake? Yeah, what you're authorizing the manager to do is uh, negotiate and enter it into a contract. Right. Um, so we could... And we'd ask you for the negotiation for the same price, right? And uh, well, we also well, need to know if it works because the one thing that we learned a lot about with the other the pervious concrete is that it required a certain amount of maintenance, including like a occasional vacuuming or something. Yeah. And if it's being laid underneath pavers, does it even work? But yeah, it may not. But, Jay, this is. Um, <laughs> For the curbing, it's, I mean, it, just for the curb alone, I don't think it's worth it to do it. Um, but I, I would ask that if you guys want to visit uh, where we poured the sample by the Harbor Park, it's probably four or five months now that it's been done. It's, and I have not power washed it. It's in very bad shape. So it would tell you what's going to look like. Well, obviously, uh, Dr. Crannon is different, but 
um, it, it, it kind of tells you the picture. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to maintain. And if you don't maintain it, it, it so, does not so, function. So since this is going to be such a high traffic area, it's probably not a good idea to do it here. Correct. Yeah. So I, I, I'm good, but I think that it's very strange to me that the materials that are available for this important executable idea of permeable surface are as limited and as deficient as well, you why don't we do this because I'd, I'd like to move this along yes we're at a price i mean guys we are about to make history in the island of key biscayne yes um, that's just don't but work. i would like i would ask jake and and, to, and todd to take a look at the permeable uh pervious material and and see what can be done if something can be done that you know if it does require a little bit more maintenance i mean this is the center of the island. We should be maintaining things here right. to, to the utmost level. So if it takes somebody going out there and cleaning it up every once in a while, you know what? Let's make this island shine. Let's make this village stand out. So I, I would I would argue that we can do both. We can consider at least the pervious materials, but let's move forward with the project as it is. So right. We're voting on this ordinance and we can consider an amended ordinance in the future depending on what happens. Yeah. Correct? I think that's mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. All the question, Chad. I'm sorry. You're going to say something. I would say that's correct. And also okay. remember, uh, the village man. I mean, there is some change order capability right, too within the, the manager's purchasing. Right. Absolutely. So, so let's go. Oh, call it. Call it. Councilmember Kaplan. Yes. Councilmember Laredo. Yes. Vice Mayor London. Yes. Councilmember McCormick. Yes. Councilmember Moss. Yes. Council Member Segarola. Yes. Mayor Davey. Yes. Motion carries. The ordinance is approved oh. on second reading. Excellent. Congratulations, well everybody. Yeah. He's dancing somewhere. <laughs> the right. next item, Mr. Mayor, is the resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida. You know what? Can we do? Can I, can I just make it? We have one speaker signed up for special public comments at this time. She's been holding for an hour plus. Can we get public comments in? now yeah is that fair is everybody okay with that yeah is that is everybody i mean i need consensus of council here on this let's do it okay all right um all right p can you do your speech yes mr mayor good evening uh, mayor. Or the <clears throat> sorry i just wanted to bring up one thing let's open it up but just in case if anybody wants to we can yeah I, I, I yeah i want to be flexible. the only That's problem is yeah, the only problem, I have no problem, but the only problem, or the only is that I want to have a discussion. That's why I put it on the item coming up very fast under uh, section 10, uh, section 11. Right. Because, uh, yeah. and I want to make some suggestions there. So it's kind of been going to be redundant. But, by well, the way, no, this it, is somebody making comments. It's 8 o'clock already where the manager's report is supposed to happen. Yeah, and, and it, but, it, but it's about the crime and band uh, situation. Well, I think she's going to get, she's getting no more than three minutes. I mean, are we good? Let's get this out of the way. I mean, I've been, I, she was held up for whatever reason she got disconnected from public comments. Fun. All right, let's move her, let her go home to her kids. Council member, I mean, I'm sorry, Pete. All right, Mr. Mayor, um, we do have our first caller. with ending in telephone number 298. Okay. Caller, please dial star six to unmute yourself. Good evening, Council. Um, Melissa White, 370 Heather Lane. I want to address the anti-police rhetoric on Key Biscayne. I don't believe it's the answer. It's been a long year and we are recovering from a pandemic and the emotional turmoil it caused in addition to the health impact. Do we need to do better as neighbors, residents, and parents? Absolutely. But anti-police rhetoric is not the answer. We are a fortunate community, but that does not mean that unfortunate things do not happen here. When called, Charles Press served this community well as an interim manager, not as our police chief for the last five months. I look forward to his return to the police department. Let's find solutions together and be the community that I know we are. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Have a good night. Thank you very much. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's go, go back to uh, the manager's discussion. Oh, okay. Mike, is it possible Please, to I have one. So I have just take the manager thing? I'm sorry, yeah, we're going to the managers now. No, I'm okay. Yeah. 
the next the item reports recommendations village manager managers ongoing project update good evening mayor council i'm going to uh just uh briefly discuss i was going to talk about the beach nourishment i thought roland did a great job on not only that discussion but i did want to pass my personal comment that he was out there every day had to be a referee to so many different groups people residents hotels and uh, my commendation uh, goes to Roland and his team for doing a spectacular job uh, of getting our beach renourished and uh, we should be very grateful to the work he did. Uh, regarding our pool interior and deck resurfacing uh, for the uh, community uh, center, uh, we received two bids, uh, extremely high bids for 197000 uh, dollars on one and and another one for somewhat similar. <clears throat> uh, subsequently, uh, Todd reached out uh, to several communities that were also doing a deck resurfacing and uh, was told that uh, they were able to do their sizable decks and their pool at a much lesser cost. So Todd is uh, going to continue working on finding the best cost available so that we could get this work done the right way and it could be done at, at, at a much better cost to the village of Key Biscay. And now uh, let's talk about uh, the big one here. Let's talk about, first of all, uh, what happened Saturday night. And I am going to say what uh, I would have said as a police chief, but what I'm gonna say as a manager and uh, your future chief once I go back into that role. Uh, this is a very difficult investigation dealing with a very horrific crime that occurred on Saturday evening. This is not child's play. This is not juveniles being juveniles. This is not key rat kids being key rat kids. This is some of the worst criminal behavior you could ever imagine. Now our community has been blessed and I know we've been blessed for the last 17 years because I have led your police department for that long. And I know that we have had a minimal, actually two major violent crimes in 17 years. If I was one of those two victims, I would be appalled. I would be horrified. And even if it's only two, Nothing is acceptable here in Key Biscayne when it comes to crime like this. But the police department has made this their highest priority as they should do. And the detectives are working 24 hours around the clock. They are utilizing everything at their disposal. They're looking at every camera, LPRs, red light cameras. They're reaching out to other SROs from other school districts because we have been get, gathering all kinds of information of whether they are young, whether they're old, what kind of car it was. This has been difficult, but they're working around the clock. And I can only say that as your manager, uh, my apologies go out to the family and the friends of this victim. I can't imagine what their young daughter went through to witness such a crime. And I have spoken to them and given them my word that we will stop at nothing uh, to find and prosecute as adults this felony, violent, aggravated battery crime. Now, I, I, I know the discussion about juveniles has been ongoing. And I'm going to take you back to the history of me getting here 17 years ago when Key Biscayne was the only police department in Miami-Dade County that did not allow our juveniles who violated the law, not violated a traffic a law, but violated the law, we were not allowed to take our kids to the JAC, to the Juvenile Assessment Center. And we were the only police department in Miami-Dade County that didn't do that because we felt that our kids were just being kids and, and, and the crimes that were committed back then were simply mischievous crimes and, and not worthy of getting involved in the system. I understand not involving kids in the system if you can avoid it 
at, at a minimal cost. But gradually, our children, and I say children because they're under the age of 18, and lawfully and legally, they are considered children, have been getting more um, aggressive in the crimes that they commit. It's gone from an egging at a house to an egging at a moving vehicle. It's gone from getting yelled at by a resident and running away to actually approaching a resident and getting confrontational. What we're dealing with with the juveniles in our community is no different than what other communities are dealing with with their same juveniles. We see what happened right across the bridge in Miami Beach, a, a beautiful city literally under siege. We see what's happening elsewhere in South Florida with demonstrations, with uh, all kinds of violent crime. Many things are happening. So in the last four months, our police officers have arrested 10 juveniles. They have written 37 golf cart citations. They've written seven golf cart warnings. They've written one criminal juvenile citation. They have given 46 trespass warnings to juveniles. They've written six bicycle juvenile citations to the kids that are getting jacked up on the back of their bike and interfering with traffic. Uh, they have filed two curfew violations for juveniles and they have 917 area checks and park and walks at the most visible places within the village that have had juvenile misbehavior going on. So the cops have been doing a huge job of doing aggressive police work and at the same time understanding that not everything that a juvenile does is a crime, not everything that a juvenile does warrants going to jail. However, in each of those circumstances I just spoke about, the parents were brought to the scene. So we are educating parents on the difficulty of their children getting involved in these dangerous situations. And we are making the parents understand their responsibilities as parents to know where their kids are, what their kids are doing, and how they're doing it. Uh, several of the arrests in the past uh, recently have been kids coming from outside the community, kids that have been hanging out with our kids, that have gone to the different schools that our kids go to, and they've been invited over here to the key, and they are hanging out, and they are creating issues for you, creating issues for the police department. So we have put together a plan, a costly plan, but to be honest with you, I don't really care right now about the cost. I care more about getting a bunch of cops out there on the street on the times and days that we really need them out there. The plan will be to flood the streets with cops during the weekend nights and to take the actions that we need to take. Uh, and that will include, and I need this to be made very clear, the juvenile curfew law that is a Miami-Dade County ordinance will be used and affected on our kids beginning on Friday and Saturday night at 12.01 a.m. They will be brought in. They will be held until their parents come and pick them up. Uh, also understand that under that juvenile ordinance, they have to be taken in three different times before they can actually be cited and be made part of the juvenile system over at the Jack. So they have to be three times picked up violating the juvenile curfew before actual action is being taken. Uh, and, and we will be enforcing every other juvenile offense and any other offense that adults or juveniles create in the village of Key Biscayne. I also want to address uh, something that was said earlier tonight, and I feel the need to do this. On the discussion of a criminal act that occurred involving an accident 
and evidence that was taken by the Key Biscayne Police Department. There was an arrest made on that case. The arrest was made based on eyewitness statements and evidence that was brought in. A photo lineup was conducted. The subject was identified and the subject identified himself with his attorney to the Key Biscayne Police Department. He was subsequently arrested on a felony charge and taken to the county. Now, what I cannot control is what happens once they go to the county. If the county state attorney's office decides not to prosecute, that is out of the control of the Key Biscayne Police Department. However, our job is to make sure that the evidence is processed correctly, that we follow every legal guideline to do so. And those things are not necessarily done overnight or in a few hours or whatnot, in spite of the fact that people expect instantaneous action on behalf of the police officers and an instant arrest. We have to do our due diligence to protect you, the village, from liability and protect the police department and the police officers from that same liability. I also heard somebody mention the fact that we kind of cotton pick the people that we're going to deal with and the people we're not going to deal with. I think specifically that was alleged that I cotton pick. I am not out there 24 hours a day and neither is my interim chief and neither is other leaders that are out there 24 hours a day, the officers have direction to go out if they see a violation to do what they need to do. We've never cotton picked, we never will. That by the way, is a violation of the US Constitution, something I have stated publicly will never happen. So my report here is that we are working hard. We are working diligently. We are currently down five police officers due to injuries, pregnancy, and people leaving. So we are extremely shorthanded. We have canceled temporarily our traffic unit to ensure that we have more cops at nighttime. We are considering a temporary restriction on our Marine Patrol so we could have more officers at nighttime. We have looked into our, our uh, agreement with Miami-Dade County School Board. We agreed that we would put a police officer over in the K-8 school. So until school ends, we are obligated to do so. And thus we also agreed to police the three parochial schools that we've been doing also. So we are willing to take our manpower, shift them. It's gonna cost us some overtime I'm willing to spend that over time. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the way things are today. I can't, I, I can't change the dynamic of how many cops I have. We react when we need to react. We shift our resources when we need to shift our resources. Just like in the military, if you're flanked, you shift your army to deal with that flank attack and you do what you have to do to meet the person that's the aggressor, the enemy that's the aggressor. We are taking this as seriously as we ever have. We are no longer considering the idea that just because they are youths, you that they are immune from the law, and day, we are not allowing them to just walk away like because they are juvenile. Right. And I'm open for any questions you all may have. Well, Chief, now I, I, I want to just be clear. I mean, this is, you know, I think when we're in, I mean, Chief Lang and I'll, Mr. Manager, apologies because you're not the acting police chief right now. You guys um, called John Gilbert chief for about a year, by the way. That's true. So. Fair enough. Um, but I think, you know, Chief Lang was just on talking about emergency situations and what we do. And this is an emergency situation. We are seeing a, an incredible influx of kids coming to this island and being on this island and, and just not acting the way they should be acting. And I think we have to address it now. We're seeing it on the beach. We've seen it with the actions at the beach club. And now what we're seeing around the village green, um, it's not acceptable. I think our residents expect us 
to handle this. And at this time, I, I mean, I'm, I, I hope all of council is in favor of, of beefing up our efforts, particularly on Friday and Saturday nights, to, to, to make sure that these kids are found and, and held accountable. And when they're doing these things, I mean, you're, you're, I think a number of you have talked about it. I don't know what people said at brief comments, but, um, you know, it's getting out of hand. I have long-term residents of Key Biscayne, people who grew up here, who were key rats, right, and did stupid things. But they got hauled back to their parents, and their parents dealt with that. And what we're seeing now is these kids are basically telling people when they're caught doing something, they're telling the adult to F off. And that's not acceptable. And the parents are now taking the kid's side and not, not realizing that parenting is a critical component in creating this, in, in maintaining the community that's been created for us. Um, so I, I want, I, I want your, your, your officers to know that I back them. I think the council, I hope the, the council will back me in backing them up. Um, I want to see them stopping the golf carts. If, if they see somebody that looks under 18, stop that golf cart, check them out. We still have too many people. I think that the kids are, are, are getting away with stuff and we have to make them realize that Key Biscayne is not a, a Shangri-La for, for delinquency and vandalism. They, they've got to understand we're serious and we're going to hold them accountable. So that's what I have to say about that. Councilmember Laredo. No, I, in light of the fact that, uh, that, uh, uh, citizen spoke on this issue and not the, the manager, I probably, I could just roll in quickly on what I was going to suggest. Uh, uh, I think the key, I support what you're saying. The key word is, uh, this is an immediate and this is a crisis. Uh, we have, uh, since I've joined this council with you all, uh, made some changes that have been positive, uh, uh, but I do know that uh, uh, questions, and by the way, uh, you know, because I, you know, with all of us did, but I made the motions. We've given the police department just about everything they have asked in terms of resources. So th there, it's not an exercise on fault finding at this stage, but I do think that, you know, as in life, in business or in politics, if something is not working, we got to try another alternative. I find in my experience that in the most unlikely places, uh, most unlikely people have suggestions that are very sound. Uh, citizens or in my private sector thing, people on the lower end of the so-called command chain are the ones who have the simple but good, good uh, suggestions. People are up in arms as, and as they should be. Uh, and this affects everything. It affects quality of life, it affects property values, it accepts, and it's getting around. Uh, and it just doesn't seem to stop. So I believe the constructive thing to do now perhaps is to hold in the fastest possible way. I even have a date, but a special village council meeting uh, when it should be right after the last meeting on the 18th or the 20th where we have presence uh, for the public to come and, and uh, not... Uh, uh, you know, not to attack anybody and not to, uh, uh, but to suggest things and express their, their frustrations. Of course, we all have gotten them over the last uh, few weeks. And then of course, Saturday just was over the top. Uh, you know how I felt about, I'm a law and order guy. I started, I ran on law and order and, you know, ticket them and hit them with a two by four. Uh, but <laughs> we're doing a little bit of that, but perhaps we need to figure out a way to do better because Talking about resources that we're doing the best we can is not, it's not the answer people are looking for. So it's sort of a caveat to your suggestion. The support is there, but perhaps if, if we have one full council meeting, and I mean a council meeting so we can legally make decision exclusively for the public to talk to us, would be a, probably a, a very good exercise uh, of information. Uh, and, and, and you never know, some people may give us some suggestions that may actually work. Uh, we tend to get caught up in our, you know, to, you know, in our lives of policing or, uh, and, and if somebody outside can, obviously can see sometimes the obvious that we miss. So my specific proposal was to try to call a special meeting on maybe May 20th, which will be the Thursday after our next meeting and which hopefully we will be completely open by then. Uh, just on, um, on the issue of crime with the caveat that I just said with the looking for solutions and uh, 
because the, what, what we're doing is, is not working for reasons that so which is okay i mean i mean it's not okay i apologize but we need we need to do a paradigm shift here it's beyond now uh just you know continue to do the same thing that would be my my motion or whatever put it okay <clears throat> councilman cigarro and then councilman mccormick i just want to say that i i don't think it is possible to overstate what took place on Saturday. In my opinion, it is, I, I would agree with the caller previously, it was nothing less than attempted murder. When you take a swing at anyone's head with any hard object, you can kill them. It is, it is that dangerous. Now, Chief, what I will say is in the last three days, I've gotten many, many phone calls from residents, as I'm sure everybody else on council has. And I've had a lot of people venting to me how they feel. So what I'll do now, I'll just take the opportunity. I'm going to tell you what I've been told over the last three days from residents, what their feelings are on the situation. It starts off with a, a comment that Michelle Estevez made at the beginning of this meeting. A lot of residents agree this is a situation that has been a long time coming. Specifically, I've been told that it is something that grew out of the kids that loiter in front of the CVS. Started off as a small group and that group grew and grew. That group got more aggressive with people coming in and out of CVS and the other establishments at that location. And the feeling is that the police department did next to nothing to handle the situation. That word got out that the Key Biscayne Police Department will not really take any action against kids that encouraged local kids and their friends who come off the island to continue to be emboldened. Lately, we've been seeing the videos on the Village Green. It could be that the group got so big, they didn't fit in front of CVS anymore, so now they're in the Village Green. And instead of de-escalating, it has escalated over the last month or more. Now, the feeling is that there is a malaise or even a reluctance on the part of the Key Biscayne Police Department to do their job with regard to the kids. True or false, that's the feeling in the village. And that is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Now, there are certain demands that residents had, and I, and I say demands because that's how it was presented to me, because this situation must be addressed immediately and there must be an overnight change On is, is what they want. Number one, they want a police officer or officer stationed by the village green all the time at night. Number two, they want as many cameras as physically possible to ins be installed to maintain surveillance of these public areas so that if something like this does happen, the people who do it can be identified much more quickly. <clears throat> Number three, they want some sort of control over the parking, specifically on the back lot by Fernwood behind the village green, because apparently that's where a lot of ne'er-do-wells park at night in the dark, so they can't be seen on Crandon. So I, I, I'm not an expert, whatever controls can be done to limit or control the parking in that area at night. Finally, they want just to feel that the, the police department is on their side and will enforce the laws that are on the books. There, was, there were countless mentions of the golf cart uh, issues, which you discussed, and, and I appreciate that. Um, but people just, they, they want to see the change. They want to see the police take a more active role and not be afraid. I think for better or for worse, it's a brave new world or a worse world, and the outside has made it into Key Biscayne. Finally, the, the issue is... We need to deal with this immediately. It can't be put off. And the, the people are demanding an immediate change. The only last thing I would add is summer's coming. So it's not going to be a weekend thing anymore. It's going to be a seven-day-a-week thing because kids are going to be out of school. So, yes, this is going to cost money, like you said. But you know what? We're going to have to find the resources and deal with it seven days a week because – until word gets out that Key Biscayne is not a free-for-all anymore, whether that's a correct or incorrect assessment of our situation, we need to do everything possible to stop this. That's it. Councilmember McCormick. 
Okay. Um, and then and then Vice Mayor London. I'm <clears throat> surprised that the brow beating was necessary after you already told us that you have a plan in place to deal with this immediately. But um, I would like to thank you for the plan. And I also really want to address the fact that while we clearly need an increased police presence, which it sounds like is the plan to address these situations, I, I, I do not agree with the caller at the top of this meeting, Mrs. Conway, that this is not a parenting issue. I, I watched the video of the kids of the Village Green. Where did any of their parents think they were? The idea of just walking around aimlessly at night with a backpack, many of which looked heavy like they were filled with alcohol, is I have teens in my house, three of them. It, it just doesn't happen in my house. Not that my kids are perfect. They certainly aren't. But we need as a community to say, this isn't okay. We're not okay with kids being just roaming around with nothing to do. I'm not sure how much of a role of government it is, but we certainly, when the pandemic is over, can look at more activities, which we've done in the past. But we need to step up as a community and tell each other, this isn't okay. And I, I know we're hearing that there are so many kids coming from off the key but I frankly think that's just an easy way out to try to make ourselves feel better because I am, like I said, my kids are these ages. I go around and when I leave CVS and I'm feeling nervous because there's a bunch of kids there that are really brazen, I recognize them. They're not all from off the key. These are our children. And as a community, we need to come together and to say, this is unacceptable behavior. It's not where I want to live. It's not where I want to raise my children. And I like the fact that the police are going to step up even more. We have been trying to step up police activity as we've watched these behaviors get worse, but we are at an absolute tipping point that what happened at the last weekend is so absolutely egregious, disgusting, and horrible for any community, but certainly it shouldn't happen here. And no one wants anything like that to happen again. But I really think that we all need to work together to make sure that we say this is not where we want to live and that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. And when children misbehave and are corrected by adults, they need to listen. And when their parents hear what their child did, they need to listen to what their kid did before they start bl blindly defending them. So that's, that's my thought on it. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor, I saw you put your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I hate to be a bore. I hate to really reiterate many things I've said before. Mike, you were with me in council eight years ago. Eight years ago, I've been talking to Chief Press and all since then, and I have been trying to promote beat policing. This is basically to have a policeman have a specific beat, one third of the village, and he patrols that. He can do it twice an hour. You will see the policeman there. He will know the people who live there. He will know the kids there. He will know the dogs there. He will know the car is there. This takes three policemen to cover this village. You take the sergeant, he's a rover. He's on Brandon Boulevard, and he's a backup for all the other people. And they don't do anything else but go and that beat. It's done in almost all big cities. I grew up the way in Philadelphia. You knew the cop on the beat. He became your friend, or you were afraid of him, or whatever. You But you knew you better behave. And this has been effective. It was effective policing for many, many years in many, many places. We have more than enough officers to do this. Uh, the chief basically, obviously, has not been in favor of it. I understand he's a professional. We're going to listen to him. By the same token, this is my suggestion. It works other places. I think it'll work here. You will know, the, you will know everybody. The, that policeman, those four policemen, will know everybody on that beat. And that's what they'll do day in and day out. It might be boring, but it might be rewarding because it'll become the friend. People will like that policeman. They will enjoy them, probably invite him into the house, probably give him a cup of coffee, probably talk to him. So will the kids, and they'll know what's happening. And possibly by knowing what's happening, will prevent a lot of the problems we have today. Thank you. Councilmember Moss. I'll keep it short, um, but you know you have my full support. Um, and, I, and again, I think these are two somewhat different issues. Um, I think the thing that happened on Saturday is not just kids. I mean, that's that's a criminal 
I mean, that that's it. And that could be any age. That could have been a 30 year old, a 15 year old, doesn't matter. Um, but that, that's a, that's a completely different, uh, for me, a different situation, but the, um, but also cracking down on, on, on teens and, um, and making sure that, uh, people are behaving correctly and, uh, upping our, our presence, uh, you have my full support. And finally, council member Kaplan. Well, I can't, um, I'll observe just at the beginning what happened Saturday night and what's happened previously, it seems to me is not the fault of the police department. The, um, as Ignacio mentioned, we've all been hearing from a lot of people. One of the remarks that has come to me from you know, a number of people is that there's a feeling that the police department is excessively deferential and acquiescent in the face of criminal activity. Uh, we've spoken about this for years. We've been assured that that is not the case for years. I perceive that it is not the case. What, what seems to me to be the case is that the nature of kind of normal behavior is, has perceptibly degraded. We, we started to confront this in connection with school behavior um, for good reason, because the anecdotes and, and facts that were coming out of en encounters and actual assaults were true. And, and that was rather shocking to us. Well, this condition is kind of permeated into the community more generally. It seems to me that it was um, a correct observation for Chief Press to comment on um, critically parenting habits and standards of uh, discipline and enforcement of behavioral norms at home. I, I think there's perceptibly a correlation between, you know, the apple and the tree. I think that that uh, calls into question maybe a broader responsibility of the community. If, you know, see something, say something is the expression that one hears um, and, and call it in if you see something, you know, complain. That's, that's a burden on people and it's, I don't say that lightly, it shouldn't be that way, but maybe that helps. Uh, the, um, the proposition of um, maybe a, a community gathering is, is a great idea. Yeah, I, I think we should do that and we should, you know, answer people's concerns uh, objectively, factually, and, and some of this is just not right. Some of these reactions I think are factually unfounded. Um, but uh, to, ter to circle back on what's next, if the nature of the problem is materially different than the way the police department was built and staffed to deal with the normal situations, and they're no longer normal situations, we, we have to re-resource our police department okay. as appropriate. Okay, so to, to Council Member Laredo's point, um, May 20th, the Thursday, I mean, is everybody in agreement on having a meeting on that day with the sole purpose of, of discussing crime, policing, and, and, and what, what can be done with, with community input so that folks can bring their ideas. I think that that's a, it, it's a great idea that we're, you know, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And I think allowing the community to come in, you know, some may come with ideas that have already been thought of, but maybe we're thinking of them in a different way. Um, you know, the, the vice mayor brought up beat policing. We certainly can, we can talk about these things. I think that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. Let's so, do it. All right. It'll be a meeting. I can't do May 20th. You can't do May Okay. How about no, May 25th? That's the following Tuesday. Yeah, I could do... What day is um what day is uh the holiday? It's on it's after that, right? The thirty first. Okay, yeah, I can do the yeah. I can do the twenty fifth. All right, let's do May twenty fifth. Is everybody okay with May twenty fifth? All right. Just one sec. Uh you guys are so popular. Yeah, I'm good. We're good. Okay. That's consensus of council. Well, hold on, we're waiting. Oh, okay. <laughs> council member. How about Oh, okay. You don't have to explain why you can't do it. That that that's uh, the twenty seventh. May 27th? No, not good. Not good. People are killing me. Um, Can you turn on your volume, Council Member Larry? I, I turned him off when he was coughing. Apologies. You How about the 19th? May, May 7th. Well, because we want Oh, the 19th, yes. May Why don't we do the 19th? 
I could do the 19th. 19th is not good. May 17th? 17th is good. 17th. Yeah, I could do the 17th. May 17th, a Monday? Yeah. yeah. Like you're going to do your taxes between six and okay. Um, the eleventh is good. I the thirteenth is on good. The Thursday. The eleventh or thirteenth is fine. He, the council member McCormick can't make it, so the seventeenth would be the best day if you know, other than being tax day. And hopefully, we've all got our taxes in by then. Yeah. So May seventeenth. The question is getting people into the chambers. We want to make sure that we've done enough to, to I, I don't want to have what apparently I missed today. Can we maybe not hold it here? I mean, it se seems like the kind of thing that maybe like the island room would be better where you can get more people because socially distanced people, this is something the entire community wants to talk about. Well, then let's do it in the, in the, in the, uh, let's do it over in the, uh, or in, in the, the gym. gym, in the gym. That's what I was trying to say. Does that make sense? We could do it remotely. I mean, like 15 people is not. No, not remotely. I, I, I think. You want to have it in person. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a value. Uh, I, I agree with you. Yeah, people, body language and everything else. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. I have no problem doing it in person. And we can do it a hybrid. We could have a camera there. So whoever wants to uh, be there remotely, whichever way you feel comfortable. If we have it in a larger uh, forum, like somewhere in the community center, and we make it a workshop, if there's not going to be an action item, it could be a workshop and we are much more I, flexible. I disagree. My emotion is that it be a council meeting. I think to speaking to your sense of the urgency that people right. have. I think uh, a workshops or uh, uh, all of that sounds great, but... We may be able to make a decision there. I'd rather be a We're, full council meeting. I, I, uh, under, I, I understand what you're saying. but the time it, is of the essence. I understand what you're saying, but what we're going to get is feedback for the manager and police chief to implement their jobs. We don't necessarily have to vote on anything. So if there's not going to yeah. be a vote, it doesn't have to be a I meeting. I don't understand why you, why you wouldn't want to have it. Let's assume be, be, because if it's not a meeting, we have hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let him explain why yeah. he wants this okay. so that we can. If, if, we can if it's not a meeting, we could have it somewhere else in a much larger room. If it's a meeting, it has to be here. And the only reason it will but need why? to be, be because it'll be much harder to have this set up somewhere else in a larger room to transfer all this technology somewhere else. And the only reason it would need to I be a meeting is the only reason it would need to be a meeting if there's, if it's, there's going to be an action item on the agenda. And that, if all we're that doing requires an ordinance or a you know, I, I, right. I live, I, as I know you heard me say in the world of public service, perception is much more important than reality. The very nature of a workshop already is people are going to say that's BS. The very nature of saying we're having a full council meeting lends it a credibility, the image of credibility that is important right now. This is an emergency. And 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 now we you're probably hundred percent right. I, 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 I agree. It's just the times. A possible solution. Okay, suppose we have a council meeting, but we always have previously when we've had big issues, we've had a spillover room, right? Where people can go and then they come and they speak here. So what we could do is have the gym act as a spillover room. So people can watch and they can attend, but if they want to come, they address council here and we do it that way. That way you can have more people. No, that doesn't work. Wait, not, the not, only, do I feel room. like to, to council member Laredo's point, I think being in person and all being in the same room is really important. I think this is an extremely emotional as well as important community issue. And I want everyone to be able to be in the same place looking in each other's eyes, hearing the, each other's tones of thought or tone of voice and seeing their body language. Are we 100% certain, right. Chad, that we cannot have a council meeting in a different location? Like, what if there was a flood in New York? No, you can have a council member. Are you going to have yeah, a council Yeah, okay. Well, then let's do So that. then could we just hold this as a meeting in the gym? And Pete, can you remotely air Channel 77? Mm. Not, not, not also with Zoom. Just a regular channel yeah. 77 with microphones. We can most likely come up with something um, by May 17th. 
Okay, Councilmember yeah, Moss. I, yeah, I just want to say, uh, if it's not hybrid, you may also be limiting people to participate because there's still people who may not want to be in a room with a hundred people, and and you know this is actually may allow more people to participate to have people in person, but also people who don't feel like coming or or afraid to come could uh, could you know participate in the meeting through the hybrid system that we have. Unless you want to do it the way that it's usually done, where people just call in uh, and they watch it on TV. I don't know. I, I think Brett's right. And I also think that we just asked the gentleman to leave because of COVID concerns. We have to be careful about gatherings. But why don't we, why don't we just let the people we pay good salaries to fix things out? Our intent is to have a full council meeting uh, at the, uh, at the, on the uh, 17th. On the 17th at the other meeting. And we'll take it uh, from there. Uh, yeah, the television is easy. It's been done and, 100 and, times. And the seven of us should be there in, in person. And, and, and we're looking for, because I think it's uh, also, I really do believe. Chad. That you, Chad, did you yeah. want to speak? No, I, oh, I don't. Okay, sorry. We thought you were trying to unmute and you no, couldn't. My, or trying I to help. Stop. No, I'm sorry. Can we call the question on this one? Okay. So full meeting the 17th? Special yes, meeting the 17th. Oh, Here? No, over in the gymnasium. With a hybrid option. With a hybrid option. Yep. Is that fair to everybody? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. May I suggest just to, for the purposes of policy making and the chief uh, slash interim <laughs> manager as to Segurado's concern, uh, also Ed London's concern, we need to have uh, chief between now and the 17th, some visible change. Uh, again, I'm going back to images. I mean, it, 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 we don't need a plan. We don't need a PowerPoint presentation. There has to be, and I'm, I'm not prejudging that you may not already be doing it, but it, but the but the urgency is now to make the the deployment uh, uh, changes that you need to 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 make, starting now, so that people feel something is changing. Visually, is that possible? Yes, sir. Okay. Council one, Member Kaplan. One last thought. I, it'd be helpful to me and I think others if you were able to be um, prepared to report on the policy of the state's attorney's office. You, you made a reference earlier to an earlier incident that resulted in a non-prosecution. And one of the questions that arises is what, what do they do with these juvenile cases in, in increasing levels of severity. If you could be prepared to speak to that, I think it would be helpful. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. And I, I just wanna address that really quick and something else before we leave. Uh, earlier today, I spoke with uh, former mayor, uh, Myra Lindsay Pena, and uh, she works for the PD's office and made the suggestion that uh, yeah. we, we bring the public defender uh, to keep us gain to discuss the ramifications of juvenile behavior and how being arrested as a juvenile, cited as a juvenile, could stick with uh, these people throughout their lives. Uh, and and uh, Vista Martinez has been doing that throughout the Miami-Dade school system to reiterate now, by the way, he's on, he's on their side. He's the public defender, he defends them but he wants them to understand the ramifications of these engagements with police. And she offered his assistance to speak on that. I think that night would be yes, a good excellent. opportunity to do that. Number one, Absolutely. I will speak to the state attorney, Catherine uh, Fernandez Brundle, and see if she would have one of her top prosecutors uh, there so that they could talk about what makes a case and what doesn't make a case because the police are a small part of the justice system. We make an arrest based on evidence, based on the facts as we know them. It goes to the state attorney, state attorney that chooses to or not to prosecute. Should they decide to prosecute, they take it to court where it goes before a judge, a jury, a public defender or a private attorney, and the jury may set them free or, or incarcerate them. So there's a lot going on in the system that is out of the control of the police department. I'd love to have all these parties involved speak about everything 
uh, so that we're all on the same page and you understand the totality of what the system actually does. Great. Thank Those you. Those are great suggestions. So the right, clarification excellent. question for Council Member Laredo's motion, who seconded the motion? I think I did. Thank you. Sure. All right. The next Let's move item. on to the next item. Thank you, Chief, or thank you, thank Mr. You. Manager. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne. Well, Florida. actually, can we can we go? I apologize if it's everybody's okay with this. I'd like to, um, Vice Mayor London is drifting out of a uh, service area, so yes. I'd like to yes. get that that item put forward so we can move forward on that. Give direction to staff. That so that would yes. be uh, the status uh, status on the contract negotiations has been Perfect. moved to B one. Let's get that done and then go back to resolutions. Apologies, but I just want to make sure we get that in there. Vice Mayor. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we we <coughs> not we, but, oh, I reached an agreement with Steve Williamson, <coughs> a respected manager's attorney, on the terms and conditions of a contract, which now is up to you to decide if you agree with it. If you do, then we'll have our attorney prepare the contract and vote on it, I guess, at the next meeting. And the, I sent you the basic bullet points, the nine bullet points that were included. Some of the items were very simple. We had no problems. It wasn't much negotiation. Basically, communications, this was the easy one. Uh, <laughs> we're going to give them a cell phone <coughs> and a laptop. We do that for everybody. As far as the insurance for, <clears throat> excuse me, for life insurance and long-term disability, death insurance, again, we do that for everybody. So I agree to that also. The, these were the easy <coughs> things. The other thing, which is very easy, is that uh, we agreed that he'll provide his own health insurance. This is a major item. Just that alone was $4,500 that we saved on our last manager. That's what it cost was for her health insurance. So they, they were all the easy things that we did. The I, I wouldn't say they were tough, but let's say that uh, they were a little bit different. Uh, the leave... He wants four weeks vacation and three, we wanted more, but we agreed to four weeks vacation and the normal sick day of three weeks, again, if he uses it. And if he doesn't use it, he cashes out when he leaves. Again, these are some yeah. of our other contracts. It's also similar to what we had before. We're going to have to go. As far as the vehicle, uh, the vehicle the basically, uh, he wanted $500, actually wanted 250 We agreed to 250 he wanted $500. I reminded him that he agreed to $250. Well, he said that we give everybody else $500, but he said $250. He agreed to $250. I agreed to $250. He would like $500, but he has agreed to $250. So that, that these are the retirement plan. Basically, we give our non-CBA uh, employees 12%, and they have to contribute 6%, and then there's a vesting period. He would like to contribute more than 12, 6%, which is 10%, which is the same thing our last manager contributed. Again, that doesn't cost us anything. The only cost that we might incur with him that we wouldn't have with any other non-CBA employee is that he would vest immediately, where most CBA employees don't vest after a period of time. The next thing which we discussed, and should we say we had a little bit of, how can I phrase it nicely? Uh, disagreement and that was termination and notice and I'm one of the people who believe it's good for the goose is good for the gander so if we went 90 days notice from him he shouldn't get more than 90 days notice from us after a long discussion back and forth and he showed that his confidence that in the job and he basically realized that that would be okay normally we had 20 weeks or five months previously we had that with John Gilbert, and we had that with uh, Andrea. So he's agreed to 90 days on both both sides. So then the next thing comes up is, what is the length of a contract? He wanted three years. I wanted one year. Why did I want one year? I wanted one year because I like the idea that each year the council would look, see what his performance was, and go to the next year. Obviously, it's a 90-day contract because we can terminate 90 days he can give us a 90-day notice. By the same token, a lot of people feel better when it's a longer-term contract, three years, four years, five years. Uh, Andrea's was five years. 
So back and forth and compromise, it came down to two years. I went up to two years. He would prefer three years. Again, I have no problem if you all want to go to three years because as far as I'm concerned, it's a 90-day contract. My major thing is that we really want to be able on a regular basis, at least annually, to reevaluate the manager. Not that I don't think he's going to do a great job because I know Steve's going to do a fantastic job. He's going to be a great manager, and I believe he'll be here the rest of his working career. And I think we'll be very happy. I think we'll benefit from, from it in many, many ways. <laughs> so it's up to you, uh, council members, if you want to stay with the two years that I agreed to or if you prefer to go to three years. I, I really don't care one way or the other. Again, my thing was one year. Now, as far as salary goes, uh, this is where we had a, uh, should we say, not a meeting of the minds initially, uh, I'm a person who believes in incentives. So I believe in a lower salary, but incentives for performance, uh, which you don't normally find in governmental jobs. It's usually you do the job, you get paid a salary, doesn't matter if you're good or bad, you're there for life if you want to be. But basically, I believe in incentives. Not only incentives for the manager, but I believe in incentives for all the non-CBA directors and other employees. And I believe these incentives give you better employees, give you better performance, and it makes you examine what's happening. It makes you look at each employee and see what are they delivering? Are they being well compensated? Are we getting our bang for our buck? Anyway, Steve did not really want to go for this. He has, he has good reason. Number one, dealing with me, uh, my reputation preceded me, and uh, he was sort of, uh, should we say, uh, how can I say it? Uh, a little cautious. Hard. So, uh, what basically we agreed to that he would start at a salary of $195,000. And then in six months, we would look at where he was, where we are, what kind of plans, what we're doing, and see if we can't put something together. So it's just, it's a, it's a commitment by me, but not by you. And again, you don't have to do it, but to re-examine everything that we're, that I've done in six months to see, do we want to go forward with this salary? Or do we want to put a, a set of plan in? And, you know, it has to be mutually agreeable with him. And again, at that time, I would all look, also look, if we're going to go to an incentive bonus plan, I would do it for all the non-CBA employees. So uh, then the leave, I told you, four weeks and three weeks, vehicle, 250 or $500 a month. He wants five. He agreed to 250 We give everybody else five. The retirement plan. Uh, he pays his own health insurance, life debt, long-term disability we take care of, and the duration of the contract, again, we've agreed to two. He'd like three, I'd like one. If you want to go to three, I can live with that. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a 90-day contract because we can cancel 90 days by paying him 90-day severance. He can give us a 90-day thing. Uh, I think that pretty much takes care of most all the items. Uh, he was represented by an attorney who I dealt with on that deal directly with Steve. His attorney, Don Slesnick, a uh, very experienced labor attorney. It was a pleasure to deal with. He was prompt, and I think we got uh, a deal done. So at this point, Tom, I'm here to answer any questions, after which I would ask uh, for a vote to be taken, decide whether you want to go forward. Oh, there's one other minor thing. Anything but minor. I forgot to tell you this. Uh, I always look, I mentioned $195,000. That's not the key number. The key number is going to cost us $234,000. $915, of course, according to Juan and Benjamin. Uh, to can tell you, uh, Andrea last year, she was 273667 If she was with us this year, it would be $281,872. So this package this year, if Andrea was here, we're saving $46,957. I'm open for any questions from anybody. Okay. Councilmember Moss, then Councilmember Laredo, then Councilmember McCormick. Well, with those numbers, maybe some of my questions aren't that important, but uh, I just wanted, I have a few questions. How many weeks did Andrea have for leave, uh, her previous manager? Um, and because how much? Same as, do, do you know what hers was? For leave or for, for termination? Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. Her, her, her pay time off. Right now he's asking vacation. for seven. I just didn't know what. Yeah, vacation. She had twenty. She had twenty days of annual vacation leave, twelve days of sick leave, and four days of personal leave. So she had about seven. Okay. Yeah. All this right. So it's about the same. Um, I'm fine with the vested. I'm fine with the ninety day notice, the severance. 
I'm okay with the two year. Um, I, I, you know, the six months, if, if we want to look at performance incentives, but I just don't understand what they are. We have to put some type of parameters if we ever want to do that. Um, but I'm not okay with doing that right now. I'm fine with the $195,000. Um, I think there's two things. I'm not sure if you received them, Ed. I sent them over to the clerk. Uh, two things I just wanted to make sure. Um, I don't like automatically renewing anything, so I just want to make sure that's not in the contract. I think it may have been in previous contracts that we've had where, you know, there's an automatic renewal of another year or something, so I want to make sure that's not in there. And the other thing is COLA, um, because we'll be coming up for budgeting on in September, and I think it's pretty close to give somebody a 3% or whatever bump so early. I think that they should not be able to get the COLA this coming uh, budget as the manager. It would be the next year after that when they would be eligible to go for the COLA. And, uh, and I don't know if we could write that in there as well. Right. Neither, neither one of those things is there. There is no COLA in his contract. Okay. That's why, again, I wanted a one-year contract. We have a two-year contract. It has That's no right. COLA. Uh, as far as the six months, as far as the incentive okay. bonus, whatever, that's strictly a discussion in six months. As far as an automatic renewal, there is no automatic renewal. Uh, it's a two-year contract. Again, um, like I say, it's a 90-90 day contract. That's what we really have. You kid yourself. Say, well, I think I think it's a I think it's a good contract. Yeah, I think it's a good contract, and uh, I want to thank you for, uh, at least in my point of view, I'd like to hear what the rest of everybody needs to say. Thank Council you. Member Laredo, and then Councilmember McCormick. Well, for, first of all, Ed, thank you for uh, taking on this task and negotiating a, a pretty good deal. Uh, I, you know, you, you put some numbers in here that even immediately we have a $46,000 saving uh, and a lot of other uh, liabilities, let's call them that way, that we had under the old contract with the previous manager. Uh, the, only, uh, the only problem I have and I send you a note is a two year uh, contract. Uh, I am perfectly aware that it's a 90 day cancellation contract. And, and that, in that sense, uh, it moves it. But I think again, going back to perception, we have just gone through six very difficult months with an enormous amount of talented people uh, that we were blessed with. And we made a very, I think a very good choice. It, it is to me a little bit, uh, uh, sends the wrong signal uh, to go from five years, which is that, to two years. Uh, I, I think we need to show the kind of support that a three or four year contract sends, even though I'm aware that uh, we have a mutually 90 day cancellation clause, but I'm here uh, for the principle of it and for the symbol that he sends. Uh, and I would uh, support everything uh, except that I would, uh, I don't believe two, two years is a fair uh, show of faith. I am confident that he will work with us uh, for a long time if he works out. But I would only ask for your, if it's okay with you, if you amend your recommendation to three or four years. It's a drastic drop from five to three uh, uh, to two. And so okay. my heart uh, is on three years. Okay. Uh, uh, with the same terms that you negotiated. Understood. Councilmember no McCormick. What's that? What? Councilmember. Oh, you want to answer? Okay, but we're, I want to hear from everybody, and then uh, we'll have the vote on yours. I think that's where we're getting to. Go ahead, Ed. I have no problem, uh, Luis. As I mentioned, I have no problem if you want to go to a three-year contract, because in my mind, as I told you, it's a ninety-day contract. I want a one-year contract. He wanted a three-year contract. If the council wants to go to a three-year contract, I certainly want to check. Yeah, but it's also fair in the content of our history. Uh, we had five, three, you know, it's, it's sending the wrong signal, I think. Uh, but yeah, we'll but see. We've got two year contracts with John Gilbert previously. Yeah. So that, that's where the two years are. Right. And it's Council my turn now. Yeah, it's your turn, McCormick. Um, Sorry, Councilman. So on this, thank you, Ed, for, for the work that you did. And um, I'm, I'm really good with almost all of the terms. Uh, on this discussion of how many years, I think the five year was clearly a, a mistake. I didn't think it was a good idea when we did it the last time. And then we were really stuck in probably longer than we should have been. So um, can I just ask in the negotiations, getting down to two years, was 
did it seem like did it seem like it was a difficult sticking point i mean to go for me to go from two to three i think i could agree but i prefer that i prefer the two unless you really felt like it was something that we're going to be souring the relationship from the get-go i do not believe we'll sour the relationship uh, i believe steve realizes he does a good job he's here for life and uh, he expected to do a good job. I expect him to do a good job. By the same token, uh, as Luis was saying, if, and I, you know, he understands the perception better than the reality type stuff than I do. And if he thinks that that is that important to the public, then I have no objection to it. Because again, I look at it as a 90 day contract. Okay. If I also agree. I think he's going to be great. And I think he's going to be here for <coughs> a good long time, no matter how long we negotiate this initial contract. Thank you. Councilmember Kaplan. Volume. Yeah. Nope. Nope, you're not muted. Now you're muted. No, try it again. Nope, you're not good. I'm not judging you, but I am. It's plugged in, right? You want to reboot the system. Yeah, good? Yeah, you're good now. Now there you go. Strange. I liked you better the other way. Yeah, but it's it's too loud. Okay. That, 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 it's okay. It's perfect. All right. voice. Real quick, um, I'm good with three years. I, I sort of see it as Luis does as well. The um, question about the car allowance is is 250 versus some other number. You know, is that just below market in a outlying way? We agreed to it reluctantly. It's the kind of concession that. Um, leads to maybe a feeling of bitterness, despite the fact that he agreed to it, if it's under market. But it's, it's uh, I, I just ask, it seems under market to me. Lastly, um, but I'm, I'm fine with what you've negotiated. I'd, li I'd like it to be three, but um, I'd, I'd like to signal my wariness about incentives. I, I really, we've talked about this over the years. I think there's a real risk of prioritizing inordinately and wrongly certain aspects of the job versus other aspects of the job versus right. all aspects of the job. So I'm, I'm not, I'll just signal that that's my bias on that and I'm good. Okay. Well, Councilman McCormick, you had one more point. I just, I'm going to ask. Yeah, I just wanted to Mike, can I answer? Your volume. Mike, can I answer? Okay. Go ahead and answer vice mayor. Okay. Um, uh, Frank, the, as far as the car goes, basically Steve has his own car. He was looking for expenses. He was not interested. And uh, I think we have a 217 uh, Ford Explorer. He wasn't interested in the car, so he preferred to have expenses. So that's when he said the 250. Uh, obviously, he later found out that we give other people $500. So that's when he changed the 500. So you say it's under market or under market. Basically, it was a negotiation. And basically, we agreed to 250. And then he came back at five. And then I brought it back that we agreed to 250. And being a gentleman of his word, he said, fine, I'll go with 250. I don't think there's anything wrong with agreeing to something less than somebody else is getting, especially when that's what you wanted. So you got what you wanted. But if you want Councilor to get 500, you know, it's not necessary, but you can do it. Councilman right. McCormick, you had a comment before? Uh, it was a question. Sorry. Go ahead. Question. No, you unmuted yourself. No, oh. okay, go ahead. Do it again. Talk now. No. <laughs> okay, it was a question more to Brett. Um, when we did the clerk's contract, did we take out a car allowance? Yes, we did. Yeah, so Frank, just to see that there's been a little shift in how we do things, we 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 eliminated it in the clerk's compensation package, and so maybe this is another shift down a road of of changing how we compensate people. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, counts. Okay. What you had a comment, Councilmember Laredo? Go ahead. Sure. Hold on. You're unmuted. Go. 
Yeah, you, uh, well, you have somebody else before you? Well, I mean, Segarola and I are going to weigh in, but go ahead. Ah, okay. No, I, I just wanted uh, – I, I tracked all the emails and stuff, and I think that uh, mm -hmm. it gives me really a great confidence in my decision that he showed a lot of flexibility Agreed. on a lot of issues uh, because of his – his desire to be engaged, but you can take, I, 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 I propose at London because I know he takes a hard line, but uh, I think that uh, uh, he showed, uh, you know, we have uh, considerable savings immediately. We have no insurance costs. Uh, and all I'm asking uh, is almost a symbolism of three years okay. uh, that I think is appropriate uh, to send the right message to, Understood. you know, and I, I that's the, the, the spirit of it. Uh, okay. Councilmember Segarola, what's your opinion on the number of years? Do you have an opinion on the number of years? One, two, three, four, six, or five? The key is what Ed said. It's a 90-day contract. Yeah, but what number? We're going to come with the number, so I need your vote on what... Yeah, just say three. Just it, say three. If, <laughs> with, I mean, well, Steve, the, Steve Williamson already agreed to two. Um, it's a 90-day contract. If he's so, doing great at the end of two, you can extend it. That's kind of my feeling. I, you know, I started off with the two in asking people in the industry, two years is now the norm for managers. So that's why I would stay with the two. Um, but that's, that's me. That's Cigarola. And that is Brett. Um, Laredo, Kaplan, um, McCormick, you are two to three. And then there's London who's one. So you all got to decide, uh, Councilmember McCormick, which way do you want to go? Well, let me ask Councilmember London, two or three, Ed. Uh, we, as I've said before, you know, I wanted one, yeah. we wanted three, I agreed to two. If you want to give them three, it makes no difference. To no, me. no, no, no. I'm asking you what's your and vote. You vote you have to with pick me. a number. Listen to me. What I'm saying to you is that, you know, it's like throwing somebody, say, hey, okay, fine. Here's something else. It's okay. You're the guy drifting in the freaking Drake's channel. Okay, Just give us a freaking it. number. You give them this three, I'm happy with that. That's fine. So you're going for three? I'm going for two or one, but three's fine. Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Come on, Ed. Pick, pick a number, Ed. Well, there's two or three. Which one? No, McCormick, you're now the vote. He's Ed just said three, so you're up. He two or both. three. <laughs> yeah, well, he doesn't get to say both. I'm saying he said three, so he can't complain later on, you know. So you two are making me choose between you. Yes, you are. I look. No, I think I'm only sticking, for him. I understood. I understand. Like I understand the idea behind going to three, but I said two initially just because I wanted to be clear that everybody coming in. I I believe two is the industry standard, and that's why I said it coming in. And I I don't want to. I don't believe it's an industry standard, and uh, and we do come you know, again, and we okay. come from five. We've saved already. On uh, your point is taken. Me. Your point I is understand, me. but I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, Council Member Laredo. I'm gonna have to go with two, and it on. isn't because of the mayor. It's because having just gone through a new manager, that I think it we would have been really well served with a hard evaluation after two years and spared a lot. So, I'm gonna go with two. Council Member Cigarilla? I changed my vote to three. Of course you did. <laughs> I saw that coming. The minute. <laughs> One, two, three, four. So we got four votes for three years. So it's a three-year contract. Um, Thank you. And then everything else, I think, was there anything else today? I think we every, all the other terms were agreeable to everybody, correct? Yeah, Yeah. it's just the timeline. Yeah, and, 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 and so, okay, so now, yeah, the, well, this is where I, I got to step in. We need to ratify this as quickly as possible. Um, Chad, how soon could you have something before us for a vote on a resolution? We, we have to have a special meeting on this. I know uh, you're not available the week of the 10th. So, so let, before I answer that, I know that um, Steve Williamson had said he either want to start on May 3rd or May 10th. May 10th. I'm assuming we'll get yes. him on the 10th. Yes. Okay. So yeah. I would suggest. No, that, um, that's not good. We have to do it the week before. I would suggest you call a special call meeting next week, maybe next um Thursday, so we can send it over to his attorney to get comments. Fine. Uh, so and, a week uh, from Thursday, that's that's the uh, sixth. No, seventh, is, fifth. Is that uh, the sixth? Right. It's the sixth. You're the right. Sixth, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So May sixth, special meeting, one item. We're going to keep it as a hybrid meeting. <clears throat> uh, Six o'clock in one item. 
we're voting on the yes. we're voting to approve or not approve the contract for the manager. Are we all in agreement? Yes. Everybody good with that? All and right. So that Thursday and and, and Thursday May sixth, six p.m. Six p.m. And, and that's hard to instructions to the lawyer because they. Right. Well, no, he they, understood. No, Chad. I mean, that's why I wanted him to okay. weigh in. Yeah, so, I understand. On the term, did, what was the consensus? Three or two? Three years. Three years. Three years. Three. Okay. I'm not, yeah, not going to try and slip in two. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to be legitimately <laughs> fair about this. <laughs> Three and, years. I say, and I have to jump on with what Council Member Laredo said that, um, you know, a lot of kudos goes out to Steve Williamson for hanging in there after. Yeah, the exactly. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was the real test. He proved, he he proved himself. Exactly. He, can handle that. He'll he proved him. himself to he me did. with these negotiations. Yeah, that was the proof. If there was any question, it was resolved. All right. Next item. We're going next. back. Thank you, Ed. Try to stick around for a while. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is the resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, affirming the building. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna recuse myself. I didn't. I was only reading, and I thought it was something else. So I'm recusing. Ed, you're in charge. Oh boy. Of the Building Zoning and Planning Director's determination that an administrative appeal was untimely filed relating to the issuance of permits for telecommunications facilities located at 210 Seaview Drive and providing for an effective date. <clears throat> Who moved? Oh, no, sorry, I coughed. I'll move. <clears throat> and second? I'll second. Thank you. Chad, okay. Chad, do you I want to go explain to everybody? Uh, yes. Yes. I would. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, what you have before you is a quasi judicial hearing. We'll be swearing in anyone who wants to testify. Um, headphones here. Uh, so I want to be clear of what the actual issue is before the council tonight. Uh, the issue that is before you is whether or not the appeal was timely filed. Um, the issue of whether or not this, the cell phone antennas were uh, are good or bad is not the issue before this council tonight. It is simply whether or not the appeal was timely filed. Um, the staff believes, simply put, that uh, this appeal is time barred. In other words, it was not timely filed. Um, the reason being <clears throat> is that the permits for these antennas were issued in 2018. Um, an appeal was taken in 2020, over two years later. Uh, the provision that the appellates are, are seeking to utilize um, is a provision that was intended for parties and in interest. It was intended for applicants and those individuals that are seeking permits. And if they were uh, not happy with the decision of the director, that they could appeal within 30 days uh, to the council of that decision. Uh, so this provision has been rarely invoked in the village. Um, I think it might've been invoked one or two times in, in over the almost 17 years that I've been representing the village, but I'm not sure it ever went to hearing. I think most of the time applicants have revoked um, or they withdrew their appeal. So um, tonight um, you will be taking a vote, as I said, on just um, either affirming or overturning the decision of the director um, that it was not timely filed. Um, I think that you'll hear arguments made that um, the reason why it wasn't timely filed is they didn't have notice of the decision. Well, um, you know, without getting into standing issues, um, the reason why they did not have notice is because they weren't the right um, part. They're not. They weren't the party in interest that was entitled to um, appeal. Um, and if they do have issues with um, the legislation itself and they feel like they should have had notice or even the antennas, you know, th their remedy really should be in court and not in front of this council and this venue. Um, you have the staff here is available to answer questions on their decision. I know that the um, appellate's um, legal counsel is here and is going to present. Um, there's also going to be um, some presentations by T-Mobile's legal counsel, and as well as I'm sure members of the public. Um, with that, um, it's up to you, um, Ed, if you want to open it up to a public hearing, if you want to allow, I probably want to allow 
allow, maybe allow the, um, the appellant to speak first. Um, and then um, you can open it up to a, to a public hearing at that point. Um, so uh, Pete, um, Mr. Tucker Gibbs is the attorney for, um, uh, for the appellant. Uh, he has called in via Zoom. Um, I think his hand is probably raised. Um, his, I think his last four digits are, um, of his number are 2720. 2720? Yeah. I'm not seeing a phone number with that ending. Well, why don't we just say this? Is the appellant attorney listening uh, to this meeting? If so, Pete, give the instructions of what to do. Yes, to the attorney rep um, to the representation, um, please raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you are the phone number with 486 as your ending, uh, please dial star six to unmute yourself now. Excuse me, Pete. I want to have the appellate attorney go first. Uh, so ask for the appellate attorney if he would possibly start the procedure by. Uh, the caller was 486. Are you the appellate attorney? Yes, I'm here. This is Tucker Gibbs. Okay. Thank you, sir. You have three minutes. Please start speaking. Uh, Excuse Ed, me, Mr. Ed, Ed, I would, I would, I would like to, um, Ed, because he is the appellant, you should allow him to put on his case in chief um, and give him a little more time than I think the three minutes, as you would as a general public. Right ahead, Mr. Gibbs. Okay, um, I, I only expect to uh, go for um, approximately six minutes, and if I would, if I could, I'd ask for two minutes in rebuttal. Okay, go right ahead. That's fine. Um, my name is Tucker Gibbs. I'm representing Andrew and Sandri Sandy Fox, James Leach, Anna DeSisto, and Joseph Walsh, who are all property owners at 789 Crandon Boulevard. And then this appeal began in August and October of 2018 with the village staff's approval of two commercial cellular to telecommunication facilities on the rooftop at 210 Seaview Drive. And that property is zoned RM10. By mid-2019, the facilities were under construction, and my clients began a year-long back and forth with the village staff via emails and meetings. These communications initially sought an explanation for permitting, for permitting the telecommunications facilities, but later began to question the validity of the village staff's approval of the facilities. On September 11, 2020, my clients filed an administrative appeal of the village approval of the two co commercial cellular facilities because they were and are prohibited uses in the RM10 zoning district. On November 25, 2020, the Building and Zoning and Planning Director rejected the administrative approval because it was not filed as your city attorney, as your village attorney has said, within 30 days of the 2018 zoning sign-offs of the building permit plans. On December 23rd, 2020, my clients appealed the director's decision to reject their appeal of the illegal commercial cellular telecommunication facilities. And that appeal is before you tonight. To understand the basis of this appeal, we need to look at the zoning code and the actions of the village staff. Number one, section 30-113 states Quote, if a use is not specifically listed as a main permitted use, conditional use, or accessory use, then such use is considered a prohibited use. According to Section 30-105, multifamily districts, commercial cellular telecommunication faci facilities are prohibited in the RM10 zoning district because those facilities are not main permitted uses, conditional uses, or accessory uses. Number two, any prohibited use may be permitted if the building zoning and planning director issues an administrative decision finding, making a finding that the particular use is allowed in the district. That's in section 30-32. But the director did not issue such a decision and, or such a finding that a commercial cellular telecommunications facility is allowed in the RM10 district. Number three, Section 30-60, paragraph 1, prohibits the approval of a use that violates the requirements in the zoning code. 
get the commercial telecommunications facility facilities up is up and running in the RM10 district. And Florida cases have just determined that a local government may enforce its ordinance and revoke a permit which had been um, which had been uh, obtained in violation of the village code. Uh, number four, section 30-70 allows an aggrieved party in interest to appeal an order, decision, or interpretation of a city official within 30 days of the rendition of that order. But this provision is useless where the date the village official, that is the director of building zoning and planning, made its order, decision, or interpretation is unknown. All we have here is the zoning inspector's sign off on the building permit plans. For over a year, my clients tried to find any indication or evidence of a decision by a city official that these telecommunication facilities are allowed in the RM10 district. And they never found that information to this day. The result, they appealed the only village decision, and I say decision in quotes, the zone is the zoning sign off on the building permit plans. The village's response to the appeal was not a det determination if a mistake had been made and to correct it. No, the village rejected the appeal. And that rejection created a precedent that allows city staff to approve a non permitted use via a zoning sign off on a building permit plan. And because neighbors may not know that the construction is for a non-allowed use or know that they might have a right to file an administrative appeal, those neighbors may be, as these neighbors were, time barred from bringing the appeal and an illegal use remains in place. <clears throat> the rejection of the initial appeal brought by my clients is the result of a village process that serves to deprive third party aggrieved parties of their recognized property interest, preserving the character of their neighborhood against illegal development decisions of local government. And that's a guarantee in the case law in the state of Florida. Because the aggrieved property owners have the right to appeal to the village council, they must be accorded the related right of notice of the administrative order decision or interpretation. Without such notice, the right to appeal an administrative decision is meaningless, and the right to be heard is nothing more than an illusion. So my clients request that you grant the appeal to reverse the director's decision to reject the original appeal, because the original appeal was timely given the village's failure to provide notice of, a, of any rendered decision that allowed the prohibited use in the RM10 zoning district. I appreciate you all listening to this. I'd love to be able to answer any questions you may have about this. But the key here is the appeal that we filed to overturn the rejection letter that we received from the director of building, zoning, and planning. I appreciate your listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, any other public comments? I, I think that there are a number of people that would like to speak. Um, I think that, uh, Pete, you may want to open it up now to public comments and call out the instructions. I do um, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you watching us on Channel 77 on Comcast, Channel 99, on AT&T or streaming us live via our website. If you wish to speak uh, towards this appeal, uh, please dial the following phone number, 305-365-7569. Then please enter the meeting ID of 231-627-8415. For those of you currently in the meeting and wishing to speak, please dial star nine on your telephone to raise your hand or raise your hand in the Zoom app. Our first caller, the Vice Mayor, is phone number ending in 591. Uh, before any of the members speak, Jocelyn will need to swear each person in. Um, name, caller? And their, name and address first. And then I'll swear Hi, uh, this is James Leach. I live and own my condominium unit at 789 Crandon Boulevard. 
Unit 701 in Key Biscayne, located within 400 feet of the property at 10, 210 Mr. Leach, Drive. Mr. Leach, excuse me. I need to swear you in. Yeah. Do you swear and yeah. affirm that the testimony you will provide tonight is the truth? Yes. yes. Thank you. All right, I'll start from the beginning. My name is James Leach and I live and own my condominium unit at 789 Crandon Boulevard, unit 701 in Key Biscayne, located within 400 feet of the property at 210 Seaview Drive. I'm concerned with the impact of the approval of the rooftop commercial cellular telecommunications facilities at 210 Seaview Drive in my neighborhood. The zoning code does not allow this use in the RM10 zoning district that applies to this property, yet the village issued a building permit for them. Property owners like me have a recognized legitimate and predictable property interest in the preservation of the character of their neighborhood against unlawful zoning actions taken by local government. This adverse interest exceeds the general public's interest in community good shared by all persons. This approval is the beginning of changing the character of our neighborhood by allowing this and other similar illegal uses in our residential neighborhood. When we filed our appeal of the legal cellular telecommunications facilities, village staff rejected our appeal as untimely. We urge you to grant the appeal that is before you and schedule a hearing on our original request to reject the approval of the illegal cellular telecommunication facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Any other public comments? We have another phone number. Caller with the phone number ending in 211. Please dial star six to unmute yourself. Hi. I'm on Zoom. Do you want me to unmute there so we don't get feedback? Yes, please. And caller, you are live. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. This is um, Deborah Martihu. Jocelyn, do you need to swear me in? Yes, I do. And your and your address at some point. Uh, do you swear and affirm that the testimony you will provide tonight is the truth? Yes. Thank you. And your address? 1036 St. Petersburg. I'm sorry, 23rd Avenue North, St. Petersburg, Florida. I have some reverb on my side, so be patient with me. Um, I represent T-Mobile and we have antennas on the subject roof. And I just wanna state for the record that um, we concur with your city attorney's legal analysis that it is time barred, um, that Mr. Gibbs clients um, are not a party of interest. This is the original action wasn't a quasi judicial proceeding that would have been noticed to neighbors. It's an administrative permit and um, the state delegates great deference and authority to administrative officials and their interpretation and administration of the code. Um, I think that Mr. Gibbs has, has confused the issue for, for the council in trying to argue substance of the matter in front of the council tonight. And this really is an appeal of an administrative decision as to whether or not it's time barred. And the code was not written for neighbors in this particular type of administrative permit to have an appeal. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions you may have. I know that we, my client had met with uh, Chad and other members of staff at some point, probably more than a year ago to discuss potential solutions that just died on the vine, I guess. So, but we stand behind that the permit was um, approved in a normal course of business appropriately. And we think that this appeal should be denied. 
I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Any other uh, public comments? No, Vice Mayor. No one else has signed up to speak. All right, no more public comments. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, you wanted two minutes to rebut, uh, I assume, the uh, Ms. Mar Deborah Martin's, uh comments. Mr. Gibbs, can you hear me? <clears throat> Mr. Gibbs. Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. You're on, sir, for your rebuttal. Okay, very much. Um, Section 30-70 gives my clients the right as agreed, any, it says any parties in interest agreed by an order, decision, or interpretation uh, in the enforcement of the terms may, may file an appeal. My clients are aggrieved parties. I stated the case that says that they are aggrieved parties, and that case fi is uh, Free Freeland versus uh, City of Hollywood. It's a well-known case, and it has been uh, cited in, in recent cases as well. So my clients have a right to file this appeal. They are a party in interest. Um, they are aggrieved by this order, um, and therefore, and they have standing. They have standing under the Renard case, under the second prong of the Renard of the Renard decision. It gives them the right to file this appeal. Um, it is, it is not time barred because there has been no evidence ever produced, and we've tried to find out exactly when any decision was made that said that this was legal and whether or not this board, this, this, um, the director had the authority to basically waive the code, which rejects this as a, as a use that is allowed is, um, has not been shown by the city, by the village. He is not, there is no rendered decision. And there are code, there's the code provision that specifically requires if you don't have a prohibited, if you have a prohibited use and the, and the director believes that it is consistent with what the zoning allows, he has to make specific findings about that and then say, okay, this is allowed because I have made this finding. And that has to be rendered. That has to be filed with somebody. And we made public records requests and we never got any kind of decision. The only reason why we filed this before you all is because we had to find a point of entry. We had to exhaust our administrative remedies. This is something that is a requirement before we can do anything in a court of law. So we are here because we only could find one thing and that is the zoning inspectors sign off on the plans for that building permit. But this, but section 30-70, which is about the appeal specifically says it has to be an appeal, a disorder, decision, or interpretation rendered by the pertinent officials of the village. And that is the director of the building zoning and planning department. And that person has not issued any such order with any findings. So what we're trying to say is we are, our appeal is not time barred because we never got no, well, one, we never got notice, but there's no evidence in your record, in your records that show they ever made that decision. There's a sign off, but that's it. And that's why I'm, we're worried. We're concerned about the precedent because what it does is allow an illegal use to sneak in. I shouldn't say sneak in, but to be subject to a mistake made by somebody, somebody in that department. But it's supposed to, this appeal is of the director's decision. And we don't know what the director actually decided because there's nothing in the record that shows he decided anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh gives uh chad i understand we have two different items right now you tell us that the only thing we're deciding tonight whether the appeal was timely and i understand the residents feeling how could it possibly timely since they didn't get notice but i think you said there's no provision for them to get notice so even though a, a normal person would say how can you appeal if you don't know you're saying that doesn't matter the law says uh they were not parties that had notice. And then I think Mr. Gibbs is also saying, forget about this 
notice, timing, or anything else. We made a bad decision, and tonight he's asking us to correct a bad decision, assuming we made a bad one. But I think you've told us the only thing we're just supposed to do this evening is to decide whether it was a timely uh, appeal and that he didn't have to get notice. Would you answer those things, please? That's correct. The only item before you tonight is whether the appeal was timely. The provision that Mr. Gibbs is citing uh, is meant for the party in interest. It's the applicant. There is no notice provision. If Mr. Gibbs has an issue with the provision and there should have been notice, then he can go to court and challenge that. But it's not the proper venue to do it here. I don't agree with the cases cited by Mr. Gibbs. The Renard case deals with a rezoning and a zoning hearing where there was a public hearing. Um, and you know what? Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry, Tucker. I'm speaking. Um, and I'm sorry. And and I don't believe that that case is, is applicable here. Um, we are talking about a situation where our staff made a determination, which happens, by the way, all the time. Um, our staff makes administrative determinations all the time. And if the applicant or the property owner is not happy about it, they have a remedy. Uh, but it's not for third parties to come and challenge, especially, you know, years after the fact, um, when the things are built, that's the whole purpose. So coming back to your question, Ed, the only thing before this council tonight is whether or not the appeal was timely filed. And in the staff's position was it was not because it was filed two years after the permits were issued. Mr. Gibbs, Mr. Gibbs, going forward, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Chad, uh, assuming that, again, it's unfortunate that his clients didn't get notice and saying legally they weren't entitled to notice, we have no choice. But then can Mr. Gibbs come back and file another action to say that our building zoning and planning department's actions were not consistent with our code and there should be overturned? And that would be a separate action. Well, I think if Mr. Gibbs believes that he can go to court, I don't think that there's an administrative action for that at this time before the council. And that's the proper venue and remedy. Thank you. Any council members who would like to speak? Nacio. Um, I'm actually seeing this from a different spin. And please correct me, Mr. Gibbs or Chad, if, uh, if I'm wrong on, on anything that I'm about to say. My understanding is the village's position is this appeal is untimely because it is past the 30 days once the decision is made and notice given. But Mr. Gibbs' clients are not entitled to notice in the first place. So they're late on the appeal, but they're never entitled to the notice. That seems problematic to me because it seems like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, number one. Number two, Chad and Mr. Gibbs, Chad, you say that they were not entitled to notice in the first place, but Mr. Gibbs clearly says differently by his clients being an aggrieved party as contemplated by the controlling statute or ordinance. No, the, uh, I think to the first point, I'm sorry um, to interrupt you, Ignacio, but let me just clarify. On the first point, the staff's decision was that it's time barred we're not even reaching standing because it's time barred. But even if we had to reach standing, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even consider you to have standing in such an appeal. Number right. one. But th that's talking out of both sides of your mouth because mm -hmm. you, you, it's time barred, but you don't have standing to determine if it's time barred. So we're not going to give you notice, but it's too late anyways. That's what it's you're saying. It's too late. We're not even going to address but, standing at this point. But you're it's admitting they never got notice. Because the they, third oh, point, yeah. no, 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 of course, of course. I, yes, and the third point, not. well, the third point that Mr. Gibbs is saying is number one, we didn't get notice in the first place. But number two, it appears that the decision that you're saying we're too late on has never, has not yet taken place. That's what I'm hearing. That there, that 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 official, there's no paper that he's received saying that decision has taken place. So, so if it hasn't taken place, it's not time barred. So, okay. you, you, so you sort of have to number, pick your poison. <laughs> well, I didn't say that the decision didn't take place. Well, well, um, where's the paper? He, he said that it's okay, stamped what? on. It's stamped on building permits that says zoning has reviewed this, 
and that's it. These things went okay. straight to a building permit. Okay. Well, so, it, now that was Mr. never Gibbs sent to Mr. That, Gibbs' clients. Way. Mr. Gibbs has that. Now, um, did he have it back then when the decision was made in 2018? He wasn't entitled to have it in 2018. It's like anybody going in for a building permit to build an accessory structure at their house and you come in and it gets routed to each department and the different departments sign off on it and the zoning department signed off on this and that was it. Okay. Um, this we, this we, provision, we agree. If, if I can oh, just finish. No, no, I, 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 I just want to get to the kernel. I just, I just want to get to the kernel. No, I, I understand what he's saying, but I just want to get to the kernel. We all agree that it took place almost two years or more after the decision was taken. Now, the point is they did not receive notice. Was that correct or incorrect? You say it's correct because they're not entitled to notice. He says it's incorrect because they're an aggrieved party. Now, Mr. Gibbs, I, I would like to hear well, from well, you. Hold on. Can I, can I clarify? If oh, you let me please okay. clarify. Okay. That, tell me, tell that, me why or why not they're entitled. Party, because an aggrieved party is not the standard here. What is the, the standard, standard is a party, a party in interest. Our code says a party in interest. Okay, what is the okay? definition of a party in interest? It doesn't have a definition, but what it, but, but I can so, tell you that no, no, it, just let me finish. Can you, can you let me finish please? That underneath the case law. Okay. The in zoning matters, the only parties in interest are the applicant or the government. Okay. Everybody else are participants. Okay, and we're not even there, but the case law is clear on that. Okay. Okay. It, but, is that defined but, in a but, case? What you just said? Yes. Yes. Which case? That is. It's a fifth DCA case. Okay. I don't have it in front of me. It's defined in a case. The bottom line is that this provision was not meant for third parties to use to come before this council. <laughs> Period. That's 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 the way. If 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 Mr. Gibbs has an issue that his client should have gotten notice, then go to court and challenge the validity of the provision, period. Okay. Mr. Gibbs, what is your response to, to that position? My, my response is, is that the, the, the ordinance speaks for itself. It says any party in interest. <laughs> that means you have interest in this matter. And the case that the case that Mr. Friedman is, 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 is citing to the, the fifth DCA case talks about quasi judicial proceedings. What I'm saying here is there is a, in the Friedland case, it specifically says that if you have an, you have an interest, if you live in a community, you have an interest to make sure that your government acts correctly and legally, and you have a right you have a property right to go into court and go and get the information out to a judge or a three judge panel in an appeal as such, such as this and be able to get an answer. And before my clients can get that answer in court, they have to exhaust their administrative remedies and their administrative remedy. The only remedy they have is this ordinance, which says, any party in interest who is aggrieved by an order, by this situation, by the, the construction of those telecommunications facilities on that roof. That is, that is the issue. Um, the fact that a zoning inspector stamped his signature on a document that my clients didn't get until two 2020 <laughs> that's important to know means they're going to say okay and we said okay we're filing the appeal based on that and we filed the appeal and we filed the appeal timely once we got that information so i don't know what more we could have done what more my clients could have done and what's interesting is during this process during this from 2019 to two, that one year period from mid 2019 to mid 2020, my clients were talking on a weekly basis with the city, with the village. They were talking to the, the village manager. They were talking to Mr. Friedman. They were talking to everybody and they were saying, what's going on here? What, what, what's, what are you all doing? Why are you doing it? And they kept on getting polite answers 
but never an answer to their questions. And then they decided they'd hire me, which was in 2020. Chad, I have a I question for you. I think the facts, I think, I think the facts, Tucker, I think Tucker's facts were a little bit off. His clients had the building permit well before. Chad, Chad, um, I just have a direct question for you. I have a direct sure. question. Sure. What is your response to, to the, the, what was just said that the fifth DCA case only applies to quasi judicial proceedings? I, my response would be, what did I say at the beginning? This is a quasi-judicial proceeding. We just sworn people this, in. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding today, I mean, previously. I mean, the, the, pre previously was administrative, he, correct? He's correct. He's correct. The 50, 50 CA case was a quasi-judicial proceeding case. But okay. what, what I'll also say is I agree with Tucker. And <clears> as he said, my remedy is to go to court. So go to court. Your remedy is not to come before the village council at this point and try to unwind this approval that's the, the the bottom line is is that you that he Nicole, did not you. have to exhaust i'm sorry you did not have to exhaust this administrative remedy because this remedy was not available for you to exhaust and the decision would be to go to court challenge the legislation the decision would be to go to court challenge the decision but instead um uh, mr gibbs has chosen to come here first um and that's why we're here today but this provision is not intended for third parties. It's not intended for the way it's being used in this manner. And, and you know, I don't agree with, with the position that Mr. Gibbs is putting forward. Let's let some other council members speak. Brett, did you want to speak? <clears throat> Brett? Yes. So, yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, uh, you know, going back to this idea of notice, uh, Chad, my understanding and, you know, working in, on the zoning issues, if you're doing something as of right, there's no, and, and there's nothing in the ordinance saying that you have to give notice to anybody else. I mean, there's no reason why, you know, if the interpretation of the zoning official was that it's as of right and it meets code, there would be no reason to give notice to anybody. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then, um, you know, I, I think that the heart of the, the thing that I think that the, the, the client or, or um, or the people that are bringing this forward is that they're saying that the zoning official somehow interpreted the, the code wrong or something like that, which is not what's in front of us. What's in front of us is that, that they are um, wanting us to overturn the untimely file, um, which is really not getting to the heart of their issue. So, you know, for me, I, I, I don't know really, I mean, I have to lean on what our staff is saying and, and I think we, uh, you know, I'm ready to, to take this to a vote and move on. Thank you, Brad. Any other one? <clears throat> any other council members like to speak? Yeah, Frank. I want to try to drill down, Chad, and and really spotlight with a, a little bit better clarity why our code doesn't provide for neighbors in this context to be deemed parties in interest who are potentially aggrieved by this action? Well, our code spells out when we have items that require a public hearing where notice is given and items come before the council. Um, <clears throat> this, our code, um, and in those circumstances, there's mailed notice, there's published notice and the like. Um, in this case, um, this is an administrative determination as to this antenna, just like there's administrative determinations made every single day. If, if there were such a remedy for a third party, I mean, you guys, it would be unbelievable on all the different appeals you possibly could be seeing. Um, and, and that's not the way the code was intended. This was simply intended for if you are a true party in interest and there's a decision made that you don't agree with, that you have that right to appeal it to the village council. Uh, and, and that's the way it's been applied ever since it's been adopted. Uh, and it's being, in, at least in my opinion, it's being completely misused in this circumstance. Uh, and I really think the proper venue is to go to court. Is this, is this, is this installation that we're talking about in, in the opinion of staff, a telecommunications facility? It is a telecommunications facility. It's an antenna. Yes. 
So, so <clears throat> what we come back to is is essentially what's how the code works, what was intended, not so much text, but. Well, again, I don't think tonight's not a night about substance. It's a night about whether or not they 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 had they filed an appeal timely. Now, they did not. Um, we don't even have to reach standing, and it's not before you tonight because they just did it. It, it was not timely filed. Period. So, so to sort of parse what you just said and what we're hearing is that this is uh, potentially unfair, as they see it, but not a violation of our procedures. You know, I, I understand their position. I have met with them. The administration has met with them. T-Mobile's met with them. Verizon's met with them. Um, the director, in his, determine, in his opinion, made a determination that he was charged with making underneath the zoning code. And, and that's where we're here today. Um, and by the way, there's antennas that are all over buildings in Key Biscayne. Um, you know, they're on several buildings. Frank, anything else? Frank. Um, last question. I think that Deborah mentioned um, an effort to find solutions. Is, is, are there, is there some viability in something like a solution? I do think that there are solutions. I do think that unfortunately COVID has delayed those discussions. We had a lot of fruitful discussions with both um, Verizon and T-Mobile and with the property owners. Um, and, you know, unfortunately those discussions fell off because of the circumstances we're in now. Um, but, you know, if, as Deborah said, if, if she said that, I would, you know, at least on my part, on, on behalf of the village, be happy to pick them up with, with her and with Tucker's clients. Um, but, you know, I can't guarantee, you know, what they'll agree with. Thank you. Any other council members like to speak on this issue? Yes, uh, Ed. Go right ahead, Luis. Well, this is... Uh... I guess the other side of complexity is simplicity. Uh, this we've been in the middle of uh, the forest of all legalisms, but I guess uh, the problem is we have an eyesore uh, in our community, uh, in the condominium side with a lot of people in architecture, as you know, Ed, and these kinds of things are the kind of things that affect uh, all of us, uh, the very character of the community. An administrative action can affect the character of the community if it approves uh, uh, something that is unseemly for the quality of life and taxes we pay here. And how do how do I cross this? Uh, trying to support uh, our professional staff, but also try to be fair. Uh, and uh, you know, the only the only good time in court, as you all know, is when you're not in court and unnecessary. Uh, expenses and we do have a responsibility to try to do what's fair uh, uh we, we we sit here to try to hit a higher purpose and i, I just don't i, I you know i don't want to get lost uh, uh on the the issues of notice etc but clearly this was not uh, there's enough fault to go around but at the end of the day how do we fix this problem and i'm not getting any solution the only concern i think i hear that our a lawyer talk about is uh, the issue of president, but sometimes we can make a decision with clearly stating that uh, it does not hold any president. I'm inclined to try to stay, uh, to go down the road to so solve this problem instead of procrastinating and them getting frustrated and uh, the legal courts, uh, obviously this is not an issue of enormous importance. So given the circumstances of the court schedule, this could take a long time and the problem persists. So I, you have to help me here, but I'm inclined to, to try to help uh, solve this problem. Clearly, as the last statement you just made in response to Kaplan's answer question is that uh, there hasn't been, uh, I've been hearing about this for the last year, almost two years and uh, some, there hasn't been much goodwill because the problem is still here on, on uh, May, or April 27th, so 
if you vote for this appeal, if you vote as the they want us to vote, uh, it's just going to leave them out and in, in, in limbo for I don't know how much my time. And, and please help me, some of you, uh, Ignacio, or whatever, if I'm wrong. I, I just I feel a responsibility to, to you know to speak to the concerns of the citizens and taxpayers, and notwithstanding all this labyrinth of uh, rulings and. That's you a Any other council members want to speak before we move forward? Okay, I'll wait for everybody else to speak. Any other council members? Uh, I would like to say that you know we're put in a very difficult position. Uh, probably not difficult because listening to the legal arguments it sounds like we have no choice. But listening to the personal arguments of what we call the aggrieved parties uh, who didn't get notice, but then again they weren't entitled to notice. So how could they uh, appeal and? Obviously, they had no standing, uh, according to our attorney. So by the same token, what can we do to help them? Well, in my earlier life, <clears throat> about 24 years ago, I built about 250 cell antennas from Vero Beach all the way around to Fort Myers. And in very cities that we went to, uh, Boca Raton was one of them. We put cell antennas into it, looked like a tree, an artificial tree. We put them in the stained glass. We did all kinds of things. So possibly between, and I, and I also believe that uh, T-Mobile acted, they did the thing that was legally they were supposed to do. They didn't violate anything. And I also believe the respondents, they didn't know what was happening, so they couldn't do anything. But possibly uh, some creative people, we have a creative uh, member of council named Brett Moss, could come up with some kind of plan to disguise these antennas that would not make them objectionable. By the way, these antennas aren't very large, usually about six feet long six or eight inches wide and usually you have to have three of them minimum you could have more but you need three of them minimum uh so for the three of, <clears throat> excuse me 120 degrees apart so possibly that could happen i don't see though tonight and tucker maybe you can answer this how we as a council cannot go ahead and say you did not file timely and you even though you say you didn't get noticed and our attorney saying you weren't entitled to notice according to law and that's where I am. Tucker, do you want to answer that? Still there? I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, I'm to you you I'm sitting here as a council member, uh, I don't see how I can not vote against you and say, you know, if you're, you were not timely. When the attorney tells us you weren't entitled to notice, I can understand how how could you file an appeal when you didn't get notice by the same token they're saying you weren't entitled to notice because you weren't a party of interest so therefore i would have to side with chad against you and i'm saying give me some reason what how i could side with you other than you telling us that the building zoning director didn't come up with a proper decision he didn't document it he didn't do a finding even though customarily we went through our normal procedure when it goes from department to department within the building and zoning department and is finally signed off by the director the zoning inspector as you called him which it was so at this point in time i'm asking you give me some reason how i can possibly say you're right and chad's wrong well well my my point is is then why am i why did why did you all accept you all deny, you all rejected the previous uh, appeal. When we filed this appeal, you all accepted it. So you told us, come on down, have your say. My position was very simple. I know you all don't, may not like it, but the, the director has never provided us with a document that said he made this approval. Therefore, we don't, we have, in terms of timeliness, we have we have been timely because there is no decision of the director that makes a finding that that use is allowed so therefore our our appeal was in, was timely because we did that well the director who happens to be the same guy who didn't write the uh the uh the, de the decision or order that said this thing was supposed to be is okay he said no 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 you don't you don't you didn't do it within 30 days well 
It's a catch-22. And, and Mr. Vice Mayor, you brought it up. It's a catch-22. I don't know what I can tell you except that my clients got – well, they, they – I think they were used in many ways by the, by the fact that they had gone to the city – not when they discovered this, the minute they discovered this, they went to the city and said, what's going on? How can you help us? All the city had to do, if you want to talk about solving the problem is say, Hey, we got a problem here. The city knows the rule. We, you know, Chad could have very easily told my clients, look, we're looking into this. We're trying to find out what we did because yes, that is illegal, but we didn't get that. All my clients got was, they wanted to have their day in front of you to tell you their story. Yeah, somebody said, yes, it's unfair. It's more than unfair. It's a process that literally gives people hope and then says, you know, too bad. You had 30 days. You know what that meant? That my clients were, gonna, were losing, had lost this case, this matter, 30 days after the, after the August decision to grant the first a building permit, and 30 days after the October issuance of that building permit. So, I mean, this is just one big charade. Of course, my no, clients I, are I, angry. I, I think, first of all, Tucker, I, again, it's not accurate. Um, we did look and evaluate the concerns of your clients. Okay. Um, I mean, that's that not accurate. You weren't there. You weren't there. But, um, and there were many meetings. Um, and, you know, I'll take the opportunity to defend the administration because they did look and the manager's office took it very seriously. Um, I, I think as to what Councilmember Laredo said, um, I think that there are opportunities to address this issue via legislation and, and other means, uh, but not uh, through the process that Mr. Gibbs is trying to invoke tonight. And if you want to direct um, the administration to try to address this issue, then I think that would be a solution, um, hopefully with working with the providers and with the property owners that we can, we could come and work something out. That's right. At the end of the day, it now? Uh, Sorry, I, I couldn't unmute before. And uh, haven't, uh, haven't had a first time through. So um, I, I'm inclined to agree with Ed in that what's before us is is fairly simple, but I also agree with Councilmember Laredo that I mean we are we talked a lot tonight about being a community and wanting to find ways to to work together to solve problems, <laughs> and I was encouraged. Unlike Councilmember Laredo, I think was frustrated by how long this has dragged out, which I completely understand. But I did find something in what Chad said that I found encouraging. And, and that was that he felt that COVID sort of stalled these talks and these solutions. And I feel very, very confident about our new manager that's coming in. And I feel very hopeful that outside of a courtroom, that together as a community, we can figure out a way to, to address and to solve this problem in a way that leaves everyone feeling some satisfied. Um, so I, I do realize that's not what's in front of us tonight. And but I do want to say that I would be certainly there with anyone else up here who's interested in directing the administration to go back at this now that we are no longer, although the pandemic continues, we are not in the same crisis mode that we've been in. And with the new administration coming in, I would be hopeful that we can find a solution to this. Thank you, Alice. Anybody else before we go to Ignacio? Where was Ignacio? Council Member Laredo, to answer your, your question before, I can only do it as an attorney, um, for better or for worse. And as an attorney, uh, my analysis, I have to say, big surprise, I disagree with our attorney. Um, you cannot deal with the tardiness of the appeal issue without dealing with the standing issue. They go hand in hand. You can't say they're late if they didn't know that they were late. Now, so you go back to the standing. Should they, well, we agreed they never got notice. Should they have gotten notice? Our ordinance says that the, any party in interest should have gotten notice or would get notice. Our attorney says party in interest is only the applicant and the village. 
Mr. Gibbs says party and in interest includes any agreed party on the outside. If the ordinance does not define what a party and in interest is, then the law says you use the common vernacular. Party of interest is anyone that has an interest in it. If you accept our attorney's analysis, basically any neighbor could apply to build a neon orange water tower next to you. And as long as some city official okays it, rightly or wrongly, you as a neighbor can't say anything about that. That makes no sense to me. The common vernacular is a party in interest should have gotten notice. They never got notice. This was a mistake. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have been handled this way from the beginning. So, so for me, it is a very simple issue just on the opposite side. I believe Mr. Gibbs is correct. They should have gotten notice aside from the fact that apparently officially this decision has not been made yet. I also find a little dis all the emails that have been submitted to us as council members where repeatedly over the course of two years, apparently, different parties tried to contact the village to find out what was going on. And from what I can tell, they were given the runaround. Nobody told them. So that, that's another, uh, another uh, well, not another, a very large equity problem that I'm seeing. So my only conclusion in this is number one, that the appeal is not tardy. Number two, that you can't say it was tardy, but then at the same time admit you never gave them notice. And number three, we have to deal with the equity issue that they were given the runaround for two years. So I, I, I can't support the, uh, the village's position on this. Thank you. So now basically we have to make a decision. We have to have a vote and we have Ignacio saying the chat is incorrect in his conclusions as the party of notice party of interest I should say. and uh, <clears throat> Chad, who is our legal representative says that basically according to the law, the only party of interest is the applicant. And the, and the village, not the agreed party. So then the question is, as far as how would people know we're supposed to give notice? Does that mean we have to publish citywide or village-wide every time we make a decision, which possibly we could by putting that in the newspaper, which we haven't done in any other kind of administrative notices from the building and zoning department. So that becomes a question, which really we haven't done previously. So having said all that, let's call the question, Madam hey, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mr. London, just one brief comment. Uh, I'm not interested in the lawyers. I'm interested in the citizens. Uh, it, it, we're all have been victims, and if I, I, I gotta find a better word than victims because that implies that there was a, an intent to hurt. But we have been uh, bothered or distorted by administrative decisions. Uh, and that is why sometimes you hear in the public this discussions about the bureaucracies and their bureaucracies. I've been here barely two years, and from day one, from day one, I've been hearing about this issue. And don't ever tell me about COVID because we have been working our butts off for free through COVID. And your, 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 your vacation is being interrupted. My honeymoon was interrupted. So that is not an excuse. Uh, and we all learn how to work by Zoom. I'm going to rest on the legal, uh, on, on the fairness doctrine that this has not been very fairly, very fairly dealt with in terms of the, of the people affected. And that does not mean I don't want to cross the line that I'm blaming anybody in the administration. Maybe it was unintentional, but still the hurt was there. And so I, I cannot support this. I respect chat's opinions i mean I'm, I'm consistently throughout my two years here but in this case um, the concerns about the citizens and the fairness of this process uh overwhelms me to to say that this is not acceptable to me okay thank so you i'll be voting against it all right fine we're going to call the question and the question is was tommy notice given or not that is the only thing we're deciding tonight Madam Clerk, for, well, the, the, no, the no, no, that's not the question. Was, the question is whether or not it was timely filed or not. Mm. <laughs> what did I say? I'm sorry, timely filed. I stand corrected. I'm going to do a roll call. Council Member Laredo. And for the purposes of clarification, Mr. Councilor, if uh, what I just said, my position, I have to vote no, correct? Correct. The resolution is affirming the but, decision of the director. So you would vote no. I vote no. Vice Mayor London? Yes. Councilmember McCormick? Yes. 
sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Councilmember Moss. Yes. Councilmember Segarola. You're mute. No. Councilmember Kaplan. On the subject of the question before us, I vote yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, I recommend that you come back to us if you believe that we did something wrong and uh, I'm certainly will consider it, but tonight we had no choice. Thank you. What's the next item, Madam Clerk? The next item, Mr. Mayor, is a resolution of the, Mr. Vice Mayor, a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, approving a federally funded subaward and grant agreement with the Florida Department of Emergency Management for the reimbursement of Hurricane Exias expenses, providing for authorization and providing for an effective date. Move it. Thank you. Councilmember Moreto moved it. Who seconded? Second. Thank you. Is Mayor Davey still here? Does he want to take over? Yes, he's coming back. Okay. But let's call the question on this one. This is uh, item. Any, uh, any discussion on B. this? Any discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion, call the question, Madam All Clerk. those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. Just vote yes. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's the issue? Sorry, I just. Uh, got sorry, that. sorry. It's uh, it's uh, resolution B. Know. Resolution B. Resolution B. This is the sub. Oh, okay, fine. Let's move. Um, on. the reimbursement of <laughs> Eric. Thank you. I just when Ed's pushing something, I'm not in the room. I got to tell you, <laughs> I want to know what the hell's going on. <laughs> there are no opposed. Motion carries. All right. Next item. The next item, Mr. Mayor, is a resolution of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, authorizing the issuance of a fire equipment revenue bond series 2021 of the Village of Key Biscayne, Florida, in the aggregate principal amount of $750,000 for the purpose of financing the purchase of a fire truck and paying cost of issuance of the bond, awarding the sale of the bond to key government financing, providing for security for the bond, providing other provisions relating to the bond, making certain covenants and agreements in connection therewith, and providing for an effective date. Move. Second. 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 Um, Mr. Manager or uh, Mr. Stefo? Uh, it is recommended that the Village Council adopt the attached resolution authorizing the Village to issue a revenue bond Shh. in the amount not exceeding $750,000 for the purpose of financing the purchase of a fire truck and inclusive of accessory equipment. And I'm going to turn this over to Benjamin for any questions. questions. Do you have any? Does anybody have any questions at this point or can we move no, on? Why did we voted for it? Why do we, we voted for it? Well, people may have questions about financing or something. we got to give them the opportunity. All right. <laughs> Hearing no questions, let's move forward. Thank you. Great job, Benjamin. Well, well explained. Let's go. Let's call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Okay, so now we have public comments. I want to apologize to anybody who stuck around for the second round um, of public comments. But uh, Pete, if you would uh, issue the uh, standard language. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you watching on Channel 77 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T, or streaming us live via our website, if you wish to comment, to council, please dial the following phone number. Phone number is 305-365-7569. Then please enter the meeting ID of 231-627-8415. For those of you currently in the meeting and wish to speak, if you're calling in by telephone, please dial star 9 to raise your hand or raise your hand <coughs> in the Zoom app. Mr. Mayor, no one signed up to speak. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next item. Reports and recommendations, Mayor and Council members. Oh, stormwater, stormwater rate. Stormwater task rate force. task force, Mayor Davey. Correct. So we've approved uh, Reftelis to help us determine the stormwater rate. Um, but what I am in talking to um, Dr. Samimi and, and Mr. Oziman about this. Um, the discussion turned to having a, a task force of residents 
who would assist with this because we, we want to get this right and we want input. I mean, obviously, Reptelis will give us the the the, the mechanism and, and the equation, but we want we want input from our community on this. So I'd like to you know put it five to get five people together. Um, you know, I think uh, Councilmember Segarola. You know, there, there's a couple of people from the condos, a couple of people from the houses, and and let's make this happen. Absolutely. Second, okay. you. Okay. I think you should throw a one business person in there. It'd be nice. Right. Okay. So maybe two, two, and one. Right. Maybe two, two condo, two, and one business person. So yeah, no, no absolutely. We're going to do a notice. I think by uh, let's have everybody submit names um, by. We're having a meeting on this. Well, but that's a special meeting. We're having a meeting on the 18th. So by the uh, the Friday before the 18th, which would be 17, 16, 15, 14th. By the 14th, can we have uh, everybody must submit names if they're interested in being part of the stormwater rate task force um, by the 14th. Could yes. you maybe give a little bit of an explanation of exactly okay, essentially, what you're expecting them to do? Well, they're going to be part of determining how we're how, what the equation is. Right now, it is... ERUs, right? Units per, um, and, and houses are one and a half ERUs and condos are one ERU. That's not, that's not a really fair, necessarily a fair equation is what we've kind of come to, I think, as a, as a community to, 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 to realize. So we've got to figure out what that is. So Reftelis will get there, but they're going to need input from people in our community to kind of give them assistance with this and, and sort of give them input. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, 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 nobody heard that. Uh, Ignacio will be the Ignacio, liaison. Ignacio wants, Ignacio wants to be the liaison. I volunteer to be the liaison. So I, I, have, no, I have no, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. It's fine. Okay. Let's, let's move that along. Okay. Um, then Stormwater on, and Jake and, and Roland are here. Storm, uh, uh, you know, again, we were talking about what's going on. And, and also, really, the, the, sorry, the task force's main goal will be sort of helping to determine what level of service we want to provide. That's really what it's going to be about. Okay, so I just want to be clear to everybody. Allison, you look- Sorry, yeah, but when we talk, so I had similar conversations with them. And when we talk for people who are interested in this in this job, when we talk about what levels of service we want, we're talking about how specifically much how much water we're willing to tolerate Correct. And I, I see that, though, also as a, a, a really a big job, more than five people. I thought that would be more fall under 2040, that when you're really going out and asking the community what they want, I mean, that was why originally we had 2040 so big and we tried to get so much right. diversity in that group because, I mean, that's, that is like a fundamental question for all of our planning going okay, forward. That's fair. Totally not related to rates, but how how much well, do it we is want it? By, by how much it costs us. But yeah, I hear you. By how much, it, it determines how much it costs, but not, not how we divide up fair how enough. you pay for it. Right. But I mean, this is such a massive, massive question. And to me, something that I really see as the job of 2040, that when you're looking at what our village is going to look like, how how do we want to develop our stormwater system? How much water can we tolerate? Right. I don't well, we, see that. Have, as Jake, this. do you want to weigh in on this? What What's the goal? Of well, the Mayor, we have we have made a ruling. Hold on, hold on a second. That uh, that in all our boards, we have seven, and we had to pay. Well, but this, this is a task force. Let's I know. Clear. So let's pick seven. Uh, it, it, this council, this council was originally just five. Let's go see. Okay, but regardless of the number. I, I right. think it's important the, the that we have very clearly defined roles. And I think that's, let, let me let me come back and let me have okay. Jake speak to that. And then maybe maybe I'm being a little too premature. Maybe what we need to do is at the next meeting, have a really in-depth discussion about, you know, about this. But but I thought you were talking about the number of, of board members. Of the task well, no, we no, can no. have that. Oh, okay. What I'm, I'm really talking about is who should be tasked with so that much. type okay. of work. Right. Okay. okay. Jake? I misunderstood. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, for, for this scope alone, what Raptors is going to do for the methodology study, it's simply we're going <laughs> to derive it at the formula that how we want to divvy up uh, who's going to pay how much. And we should take that back. Not who's going to pay how much, but who's going to pay what percentage of the cost that at some point we're going to spend. 
so there are different ways of uh, uh, ways of doing this, and and uh, one can argue that one is good and the other one is bad. But there are different municipalities that have done different studies. For example, City of Fort Lauderdale recently did a study based on traffic trip generation. Simply, they they used ITE Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Handbook, and they did their stormwater rate allocation based on trip generation. There are the municipalities that they do it based on the acreage and the size and stormwater generation. And there are other municipalities that simply do a basic formula like this used to have, one and a half to one ratio. So what Raftelis is gonna be charged to do is come up with a formula and 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 show us what percent uh, each party is gonna pay, one being uh, whether a condominium or uh, a residential single family or, um, a, a uh, commercial, right? So that that's the scope. And 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 another question is how much we're going to spend and what level of service that we're going to attach to this. That's a bigger question. And yes, this task force can discuss it as well. But their primary deliverable will be to this council recommendation on the methodology, on the calculation. Okay, Councilmember Moss. Uh, just question is, do we really need to put a task force together? Can this? I mean, it seems simple enough that we could do it by council. I just don't know if we need an extra layer. That, that, I'm not sure if it's really needed. Okay, and, well, then, then, I mean, that's the discussion to have. Unless, unless, sure. the, unless the staff needs it. I, I don't know, but I just don't, I, I see that it can come. We, we, I mean, uh, right, I, I do look out for some direction in this area. It's it's very hot topic for, for very valid reasons. Um, again, there is multiple ways of doing this methodology, and not a single one of them is wrong. Again, different municipalities go with different methodologies, but I alone cannot make the decision. That's why we're looking for some sort of direction from council. Because okay. Councilmember Segaro and then Councilmember Kaplan. If you're going to have a company like Raftelis come in and do a job just from experience with the underground task force, you're going to want a task force because Raftelis has a very involved process with a whole lot of information and them giving it directly to council i think there's too much on our plate to deal with running the village and that that that's a big uh, time consumer uh if you're not going to use raftelis and you're just gonna you know have a workshop to discuss how we're going to change the formula around then you don't need a task force no but we are we've hired raftelis. Right, right. so if, if raftelis is coming in I, I would suggest go with the, with the task force can I wait, wait, council member Kaplan is first. I, um, I see it like Ignacio uh, for a slightly different reason. I think that the, val the value in a check and balance by smart people paying attention to Raptelis's assumptions and proposed methodologies is a useful thing to do. And I'm thinking specifically of the undergrounding assessment allocation which i thought was you know kind of we just it just it, it had some logic but it kind of broke down in practicalities for no, me right i hear you okay so now, i think that's a good idea councilman mccormick frank the idea of of drawing from our experience with the underground utilities task force and the methodology that was developed by the consultant brings me to a similar place of of concern, but I go to a totally different spot. Uh, sitting up here and receiving that and seeing what happened to the community, I, I feel like that's something the council should manage. This stormwater rate has been a discussion since, I'm sure before I ran, but it was certainly a big discussion the first time I ran. And I, I want to be a crucial part of that decision making and the guiding of that consultant, that giving it to a task force, when this is something our community really, really cares about, talks about constantly, it is really one of the biggest issues that we've had. I think it should be us. Question, um, it, it ultimately must be. But yes, it, but think if you think back to what I'm saying about if you think about the experience we went through with the Underground Utilities Task Force, and when it came before us, it was so cooked, done, tied up with a bow, that it it ran and took on a whole life of its own, which I did not think was healthy for our community at all, and I don't want that to happen again. 
So, so my premise is, is the check and balance. I think we can do that. We will do it ultimately. But if, the, if your experience in the last term was that it got away from council because it took on a momentum in life of its own, I, I hear you and I'm fine doing this ourselves. I think we can and we must. Somebody has to. You're mute, mm, Mayor. But, um, well, you know, I just wanted to add something. I, I, I mean, I want to get this done quickly. You know, I want to get it done right. I want it done quickly. We're going to have to re listen to everything. We're not, the advisory board is not going to come and say, just do this. And we're just going to say, yes, let's do it. No, I mean, they're going to present everything to us again. And we're going to go through the whole process again. Um, so I think that, you know, taking it to a task force, I don't think it's going to speed it up. I think it's going to slow. Um, and in the end of the day, we're gonna have to listen to it all again. I, I, I mean, obviously we'll list, listen to the advice from the advisory board, but I still think that a lot of us still want to hear all and all the options and information before we, we make our final vote on such an important issue. So again, if we want to have that stormwater task force, I'm fine with it, but I just think it's just a thing that we are adding to the layer that's just going to go through and it's just going to take longer to get done. All right. I'm well, really this sounds like something we should probably, uh, we, we should have, uh, you know, at the 18th so we, we can go further okay. into this because it seems like we're, we're a little split on this. Um, but additionally, and Jake, you're here uh, talking about the next item is a workshop on stormwater system and next steps. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're mute. We, we can't hear anything. Sorry there. Sorry about that. Um, just as an aside, I got a text message from f former Mayor Lindsay that she's been trying to call in all night, but she can't get through. She tried calling to both public comments. Uh, I, I approached Peter about it before, but we haven't seen her. I don't know if you'd okay. allow what's her to What's her last three digits of her number? Because there's somebody in the waiting room. She's a, yeah, 607. I see. Yeah, they're in the her. waiting room. All right. Let her, uh, yeah, absolutely. I admitted her. She's in now. Okay, I, I guess she's been having trouble trying to connect. So, you want to open up the public comments real yeah, quick? Yeah, real open public comments. I mean, obviously, we want to facilitate people. Yeah, she should be on now. I don't see her. Anymore. You want to repeat the instructions, Peter? Yeah, Pete, go ahead and do the instructions again. There, she's on. She's on. on. Oh, there she is. Oh, All right, is. go ahead. There we go. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Myra Lindsay, 365 Westwood Drive. Um, Mayor, council members, I'm calling in. I, I was traveling this week and I came home to um, a lot of news on the Islander and what have you regarding um, the incidents of violence on the Village Green. I reached out to Chief Press just to express my concern and to see if we could assist. And um, we discussed having the public defender come in and do a presentation on the consequences of an arrest uh, for children and how the consequences stay with you for the rest of your lives. It's something that sounds like both children and parents need to know that there are real consequences such as immigration, licensing, schooling, credit, um, problems that then you have to deal for with the rest of your life even even if you seal and expunge the record is still there with FDLE and chief um expressed interest i reached out to the public defender and he uh is willing to do this presentation or interactive presentation for our community so in in um the context of helping out and giving support and adding a resource that may be needed. I just wanted to make that offer. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, the the inter interim manager mentioned that. We appreciate it. Um, so hopefully we're going to get something organized for May 17th, if that's possible. So thank you on that. Volume. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. It. Okay. All right. Have a great night. Okay. You too. Okay. So. Um, where were we? Oh, workshop on stormwater system. Well, what are you going to do about the task force? I think we're going to t we're going to move it to the to the 18th. I think you know because this sort of goes dovetails with the next item, which is the workshop on stormwater system, and next steps. 
Um, so there's discussion. Jake, you want to talk about that? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, as some of the council members, uh, Roland and myself, did some briefings and and uh, and discussed uh, the findings of ACOM's first task order. And we're at a point that uh, we, we would like to start the discussion at the, the council altogether and 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 make some decisions because the decisions that this council is going to render is going to shape up uh, the task orders down the road and on on subsequent projects. How we're going to design such as boundary condition termination, sea level rise projection, what level we're going to pick, the level of service that we require. Um, so we like to set a series of workshops so that we can start a discussion and, and get the ball moving on combating sea level rise. And what, what dates are you thinking about starting this off on? We are ready as soon as the council is ready. You tell us and we'll be, we'll be there. Um, are there thoughts on, on any dates to start the workshops on stormwater? Any. Well, why? Nobody, nobody can hear you guys. Oh, we can hear can each you? other. No, I, I actually we can't hear you. Can you nope. hear me? I can hear you. I can hear yeah, Frank. You, you got that little thing. You got to make sure the red button's on. You got to make just in. press it. Okay, now. Now, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, it depends what scope of. Well, my original comment was. You might want to wait until you decide on the task force to do the workshop, but you you can have a workshop. Just depends what scope you want that workshop to have, because a task force may or may not. That's the rate, that, and that's really more about the rate that pays for everything. Okay. That's more of a. But this okay. is this is going to determine. This is more to Councilmember McCormick's right. point about the level of service that okay. our community wants, and I think it's important to have a service. Like uh, Jake, what's your what's your plan? Of, of how many workshops would you be talking about? What would be the what would be the scope of each workshop? I mean, this is a lot of information for people to digest right. and, and, and make opinions. And, on. and based on my discussion with Roland and talking with ACOM and reviewing the, the, the information they provided to us, it's gonna be at least four to five meetings to to, to go over. It, it is it is a it, because the major the decision that that the council is gonna render at the end of this workshop is really gonna drive the project. Because it's going to set the boundary conditions and and then uh, the criteria for this project to move forward. So, so let me ask. You, so let me ask you this: Do we want to start that in May and then stop yes. have the whole summer? Okay, so start in May, have one in May, one in June, and then go August, September. Yes, yes, that would that would work. And again, it depends on the progress that you're going to make in each workshop. It's going to structure the following workshop. Okay. And. Uh, can you get uh, some yeah. dates? Can you sure, get some absolutely. dates and and pass them around and then council yeah. them in through the clerk? I'll, and, I'll work with clerk to circulate perfect. some dates and and set up the, this the first one and then we move on there. Right, Councilman McCormick. So one of the things that came up when I was discussing this with um, Jake and Roland was this incredible need for our community to to be a part of this decision making and setting these boundary conditions, but also just how difficult it is to try to penetrate and and get each to get to each person or as many as possible. And so I think it's really important that we reach out to 2040, that we reach out to the community and have these workshops because we we're going to be making some really major decisions about how much water we're willing to live with. And when I went through it with them, there's so much information that I think our residents who really do like to take the time to understand an issue are going to want to attend multiple workshops and are really going to need to absorb all of this information. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we removed the budget for community outreach from this ACOM project, which I, I'm not going back on, but we are going to have to sort of pick up the mantle ourselves and with our boards to and with our staff to bridge that gap because this is going to be so important. We're going to be really tearing things up to put in these new stormwater systems. And, and then you want the end result to be what people want. So just if I could share that reflection from the meetings that I had with our staff. Well, I agree. We need, we need inclusion. It's, it's critical that people are involved in this. Council member Kaplan. I, I worry specifically about ACOM's, um, I, I suppose, prospective disengagement from this because 
the city, the city of Miami's, um, for example, story that was in the Miami Herald this week about their version of what we're talking about, resulting in a terribly complex, very expensive process that is predictably not going to work in all places at all times. And so the I, reason I mention that is because to build the case with credibility for the population here, that the same result may prevail to some degree, you know, that we're going to invest in these things because we have to, but that perfection is not going to arise. And to be able to make that case with credibility, I, I'm afraid requires engineering expertise that is ACOM and not us. So that's just a note. All right. Well, let's get some dates circulated to get these things going, and then let's draw let's draw in the the strategic vision board and and as many residents as we can get. Thank yes, you. Sir. Next item. Teen advocacy advisory right. board. Mayor okay, Dean. so you know, as we've all been talking about this evening, one of the issues we we've, we've been facing is is issues with teenagers. But for a long time in this community, we have as a community, I think misstepped and not been able to draw out our teenagers in and, and there are look there are a lot of good kids in this town like there are a lot of kids who want to find something to do on a friday or saturday night and not just mill about and do nothing or be stuck at home or and and not just walk around they want something so my idea was this it would be a seven person board it would be made of four teenagers two seniors two juniors we would then have three adults working with them to both advocate for programs that are good for teens that teenagers are interested in. Um, maybe it's a skate park. I don't know if we all got the email today about the, you know, renewed interest in a skate park, but there's also, you know, midnight basketball. There, there's um, battle of the band type things. There's, there's things that, you know, kids may want to do that we're just not in touch with at this point. And I think having an engagement between our, our, our high school kids um, who are certainly more in touch than we are, and, and some local adults. Um, I was thinking one would be somebody who works with kids, maybe a youth counselor or a youth minister. Somebody would be, um, a, you know, a, a, youth, a youth psychologist or, or, or somebody who can really talk to the teenagers, and then a parent who's engaged with, with teenagers. And at the same time, we would have a liaison, and I've, I've asked the manager about this, you know, having a liaison from the fire, to, uh, from the police department and from Parks and Recreation to all sort of work together. Because I think one of the things we also want to do is cultivate a relationship between our kids and the public safety people they're, they're engaging with. Um, but I, I just think we need to be doing something, and I really think that this can work. Um, if, if we get them... If we get people talking, if we, if we get the kids to feel like we're trying to engage with them, if, if we give them an avenue to come to us, you know, the youth council's tough because there's not, there, there isn't the structure that there is if there are kids sitting with adults, sitting with people who are in the government trying to make programs that work for the kids. And I think, I think it's really something, you know, I've been, I've been having people come at me trying to, you know, poke holes in it. I just feel like it's something we need to give a shot because I think we can catch a lot of these kids. They're good kids who just get bored and do stupid stuff beyond they get to the stage where they're, what's going on now is happening in this community. So I'd like your support. I'd like to come back with an ordinance to create the Teen Advocacy Advisory Board with made up the way that I, I'm, I'm suggesting. Um, and I'd like to bring it back ideally by the 18th or, or the meeting after that. If that's okay with everybody, the idea. certainly. Uh, Councilmember McCormick, Laredo, and Moss. Volume. Sorry. I think it's a great idea. Um, I think we've tried different things over the years, and I'm all for trying something else. Uh, my one question would be just about the makeup and the ages. I think that the the kids that I see that seem sort of the most adrift are a little bit younger. Okay. I think once the kids get older and have their license and have a car, I don't see them as lost. And I, I think there's a value to having them because they may have lived through it and seen right. it and have different ideas. But I would just ask you to consider maybe playing with the makeup a little bit okay. to get maybe some younger high school kids. Because I think what we really see are, are concerns with kids that are, you know, late middle school and early high school. Okay, that's fair. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to consider them. I'm, you know, if you've got comments and you've got questions, and then when it comes back for a vote, well, I think we can all make our determinations. Councilmember Laredo, 
and then council member wants I, I got you no i support it uh, i just hope that uh, two years i've been hearing about doing things for youth which i think and we get we lawyer it to death Agreed. That's uh, why I want to get it going. It's a, I so that was one of my biggest frustrations of my first year. I've had, uh, you know, and they got pulled out because of this stuff about uh, uh, what is the sunshine and all that kind of crap. They just do it. Yeah, agreed. Just okay. Thank you. I'll bring it back. Hmm. Next okay. time, Mr. Mayor's 4th of July. I'm sorry, Councilmember Moss, did you want to say something? I apologize. I no, 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 I just said I supported it. Okay. You. Thank you. All right, 4th of July. Um, I want us to have a parade. I think we've yes. gotten to the point, and I think by 4th of July, we will be at a point where this community can support a parade. I think our people are looking forward to it. Um, obviously, we'll have to, you know, we'll have to do what we can to, to be safe. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, outdoor activities, I guess today, they said you can go outdoors if you're in smaller groups without a mask. Um, you know, I, I may still be wearing a mask on July 4th just because it's, Absolutely. if only as a sign of, uh, you know, respect for those who need to be wearing a mask or who need us to be wearing masks. Um, but I think it's important for this community to start getting going. Um, I did ask Todd, I, I asked some other communities, nobody seems to be doing fireworks for this 4th of July. So I don't think it's a good idea that we are the only community in South Florida that does fireworks. Uh, because I don't want us to be the focal point for everybody coming onto the island on the 4th of July. Um, so what we may be able to do, and, and Todd may be able to speak to this at another point, we do have our 30th anniversary coming up this fall. So maybe what we could do is make that, we can incorporate fireworks into that celebration at that time. Um, you know, I, I support it. Okay, so let's... And if a worst case scenario, you can pull back. Right, exactly. Yeah, well, exactly right. People but let's start people planning. Get and, out. Yeah. and I just want the Key Biscayne, you know, the, yeah. the, the K3, the K3, the, the KB uh, 4th of July is, uh, you know, they, they're chomping at the bit to get going, get it organized. So I just wanted to get your approval so that uh, we can get working on this for this year. And staff, uh, the manager is, is, is in support and uh, Todd is in support. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. Let's get going. Yep. All right. Um, appointments to advisory boards. That's my next item. I had a number of, of people ready to go, but it was really just to fill some vacancies. I'd actually, I have, there are some board where there's one board where I'm pulling people off. Um, but council member Laredo sent an email that, that and I'll, I'll paraphrase, um, essentially that we need, you know, we have a lot of long time people on these boards. And it's something I'd heard from others that we have to get new blood on these boards. At the same time, we need some of that historical knowledge on yeah. those boards. You know, those boards that are there, you don't want to just wipe them clean and not have people understanding what, what is going to go. The concern is, okay, so who do you pull off and who do you, who do you leave on, right? That, that's, that's a tough decision to make. Some of those people have been on there since Bob Oldakowski appointed them back in, in the early thousands. So the question for me to you is, what do you see, given that all these, essentially all of these committees are, are seven people, my, I was considering having two people remain and then replacing with five at this point. But I want buy-in from all of the council. I don't want to be the one kicking. I don't want to be it to be, oh, remember when Mayor Davey kicked everybody off the boards? I want it to be us saying, yeah, we need to have this. And if we're not in agreement, because I'm, I'm, I'm torn both ways. I definitely see the, there's, I mean, this is not even, this is just one little stack of people who sent their resumes in. There's a lot of interest in being on these boards on this island. We have a lot of people um, who want to be involved, and I think it's great, and I want to reward them, but I also don't want to be penalizing people who have spent a long time being dedicated to doing great things for this village. Well, since so I, I want to hear... I, I support, you know, since this is, uh, you know, and this is consistent, you know, we we did a big workshop two years ago to rationalize it. So we're we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I, well, some of the issues are going to be resolved after you. You know, one of the reasons uh, it's a hot spot for the mayor, but that charter commission kind of did it. This is sort of a co-appointment, but to put the blame on you to recommend you know, whoever sits as mayor, and then we have to approve right. it. But it's it's Fisher cut, cut bait time. I think if you're going to be serious. Uh, I think we need to go back and clean up a lot of stuff, uh, you know, the two-year limit, uh, which means you can be reappointed. But uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's stuff in here that says at the will of the council. That doesn't work. You need to I have agree with two that. Year. 
and you have a staggered system, which is how we started this village in the stagger as we started. So it's not the brain uh, surgery. So I would probably only amend, there's other couple of issues that I want to discuss either today or another or next week in terms of the profile, but I would only probably go to three. Okay. Because so. there is a lot of good talent there. Uh, and two, maybe a little bit too sharp. You know, it's three. Uh, New members or three old members? No, mem three old you members. You suggested two old. You suggested to keep two. No, I suggest, yeah, and you saying keep three. I think so. Okay. That, I, I, I'm, I, I just want to hear at the from names, you guys. I think that they're. Well, that's the thing. I'm, I'm making yeah, some. Yeah, three is a little bit, it's still tough. And I may. And, and look at the, some of the, uh, look at, as you look at them, also look at some of the times. Right. Some people no, are, you know, some people got off mm -hmm. the uh, 2040 who were just had appointed. So they got right. to serve three months. Uh, so I, I, I support this mm -hmm. and it's moving in the right direction. Okay. Do uh, uh, you want me to give you a couple of other issues for the. Uh, yeah, no, uh, if you've got other issues, please. I'd like to hear uh, them. I, uh, as you know, I've, I brought it up. I was going to try to do it in a, in a, smaller group, but I do have uh, a concern about, uh, again, perception, either conflict of interest or perception of conflict of interest. You know, if, if somebody is does business with the village, either does business or is in the process of doing business, I think it's not, I don't think it's right to, to be on a board and nurturing relationships. I don't Okay. I, I Are there specific items, uh, specific concerns that you would have? Cause well, I, I had you know, I, there were people. There are people who who are doing things in the village, who are on boards. Uh, I, I brought it up at the last meeting, but I was not voted. Uh, I was not voted. Uh, you know, I don't want to know if you want to get into names, but that's uh, that. That should be a policy, though. Well, if somebody's doing business with the village, yes, like a vendor. They're a vendor, All right? If vendor or a lawyer or. Or that kind of stuff. It it's not it's not becoming. They should first of all. They shouldn't out of their own bullish. It's just not doesn't look right. Uh, well, uh, but if they're doing if they're do, you're saying if they're they're making money off the village, or are you saying they're if they're coming everywhere else I've been to. Right. The ethics. I mean, also you have your own ethics. Right. Correct. If you're doing business with an entity, you're not supposed to be also advising that entity uh, in any way on the board meeting. Uh, there, there are people who are directly involved okay. on our decisions. Well, if you have knowledge that, of people that, like, I, I'd be happy, you know, pass it along to me and let me take a look because I, yeah, obviously well, I'll you don't do want that. But also, anybody. I think we ought to make a statement. What we need to do is have the lawyer make some guidelines for you to suggest, or whoever's the mayor. You know, the two year, the the conflict. Uh, also, I mentioned before, it's we should really have uh, no more than one board per person. The, the election, no matter how you feel, number of candidates and this overwhelming 17 people applied just for the 2040 plus right. the other one shows you that there is energy. No, I, I agree. I have no, so I have no issue with that. People, you know, should only serve in one board. It's not okay. fair. Uh, and there isn't any ar argument of any, you know, you don't, we don't, none of these boards require a nuclear scientist. Correct. Uh, and that, those are the, the two okay. issues that are. All right. Well, but that's easy. But if you have any knowledge of anybody who's doing business with the village that you have concerns, I mean, let, let's, yeah. you know. I, but I let's like make it a policy. Yeah. Well, I think it should. Yeah. Councilmember McCormick. Um, to take Councilmember Laredo's desire to make sure that we have the right perception out there. I think when you're looking at these boards and looking at asking people to step down or taking them off and trying to decide who should stay, who shouldn't. There's a lot of sort of delicate footwork that needs to happen, Correct. especially when you're talking about people who are maybe serve on more than one board, because I think right now it seems that the pendulum has swung in a direction where we're incredibly fortunate that people want to serve and that we have perhaps more people than we have positions. But I can say in my tenure up here, that hasn't always been the case. And I imagine through the years, it hasn't always been the case. So when I'm not saying I disagree with saying that you can only serve on one board, but there are clearly were times throughout our history 
where we were so in need of people to serve. That's true too. That we were grateful for people to be willing to volunteer on more than one. That's right. So I think that when we're when you're looking at these things, that you need to keep that in mind, and when you're having those conversations with people, okay. that you know we have advisory boards to the council, and if we've decided that you can serve on one advisory board to the council, then you know, when you're talking to people, you know, we need to keep that in mind. And I would say also with, to the idea of leaving, I like the idea of three people for a longer tenure, because I, I will say my own experience with boards, there is so much value to the institutional knowledge that these people have. And when you want to see really good work continue, you need that to a certain degree. You don't need it forever. And when you're when you're doing this, my advice would be to ask the chairs That's to, what talk, I was going to, do. to talk to their own people Correct. and, and see who wants to step down Correct. and they might make the job easy for you, but also to give them a heads up that this is sort of coming that while you're staying on, this is probably going to be your last appointment if we have people who want to take over. So not only should you be guiding the new people, but really preparing for your exit. Agreed. And I think that's, you know, that is something. The end of the meeting. What's that? Okay, sorry. I just want to be real quick. I, well, I will be or reaching out to liaisons to to assist me with with the boards. Um, okay, so sorry. Go ahead. Ed's been segmented. Ed, I'm sorry. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, Ed, go ahead. Thank you. I think you can resolve that, uh, Allison. By only people serve only one board. If they do not have enough applicants for another board, then they can only serve one board. Then you can serve on the second board. Number one. Number two, the conflict of interest thing that Luis is talking about, I think is excellent, and that should be our policy. And that way, there's no conflicts. At least we know what the problems are, and we avoid them. Thank right. You. Okay. Um, are, are you going to do an extension or um, move to extend for ten minutes? I'd prefer uh, not to. What do we have left? Oh, flashing uh, lights. Okay, flashing lights. Yes, just, uh, just I make a motion. I'll just make a motion. Uh, which I I brought this issue 20 times. Well, it's better by motion, and there was a very uh, elaborate presentation this morning that we should just uh, not request, but direct our manager to uh, if it's not and it is legal because otherwise, city of Miami or the city of Key of Key West, which Jake was with me when we saw it, have red pedestrian lights, and don't come back with an excuse about why. Just get it done. I think it's very good. In, uh, it's a very good idea. It's working somewhere else, and people understand the red lights. They may give you a wishy-washy answer about yellow, but they there's no wishy-washy about red. So I think it's a. I every time I go through in front of the park, I say this is, and you know the little kids on the little. Oh, things, I know. I see it. I, I mean, I'm just. I've missed Council Member Laredo. Are you, are you talking about just in front of the park, right? Not the yeah, other flashing lights. Yeah, the, the other one are right between two lights, so it would be like three lights. Yeah, and, the, and, and, and Crandon, that's it's where it's an accident waiting to happen. And, the one uh, in front of the park. Correct. Yeah, I think there's two. Yeah, no, not the other one. Guys, yeah, but the other one, one is between two lights. Hold on, we're at 1059. Can, can right, we okay. just extend for, for three minutes or to let Councilmember well, Laredo move? That was it. That was my motion. All right, well, I just, okay, we're going to ask the, the manager when move he comes to on to extend three minutes. Motion to extend, Council Member. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Let's motion go. carries. All right. So real quick, so you're asking us to direct the manager um, to to get those to be red lights. Period. Well, okay. Let's... No, because I've asked this before, I and we have an answer, which is a non-answer, and I'm telling you. That I see it on Brickle. But I think Brickle has a different situation, and Monroe County has a different situation. No, this is City of Miami. Jake, Jake, do you want to speak to this real quick? you got a minute. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Council Member. I, I'll give you some progress update. This is not an excuse, but, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, what has happened since last year. Uh, just before COVID, we met with, uh, I think Mayor Day was there. We have represented from Ritz um, and uh, Grand Bay, traffic engineers. So we started a conversation with the county. All the traffic lights governed by the county, they permitted. And, uh, and it, last year, June, about a year ago, we got an answer from the county that, uh, you know, because COVID, there's not really uh, enough traffic for them to put the council on and this or that. 
fast forward, we pressed him again. Chief Press and I had a meeting with the assistant director probably about a month ago. We pushed him on uh, uh, the entirety of Crandon Boulevard and traffic issues, not, not only that area, but entry block. Uh, but, but, but Jake, forgive me for interrupting. I'm sorry. You and I saw this in yeah. Key West almost two years ago. Second, we see it on Brickell. Uh, we always get the same answer. Uh, right. Can you just get it done? Just I'm telling it, you, I I, 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 unfortunately, it, it doesn't uh, just get it done. There are certain oh, steps see. that you have to follow. Well, we've been at it for two years. Signal warrant analysis. So we, we, met a, we had a meeting with the county, with Chief Press and myself. We pressed them on the issue. So they laid down this traffic count tubes. I don't know if you notice or not, but you, you yeah, know it's tubes, them. traffic counts. So once they have this number, we actually did the process of the warrant analysis to see if we can put one there. So that's what we do. Oh, doing. okay. So they're, they're, right, yeah. you're in the process. Correct. Correct. Okay, well, that's then keep at it. I have, to, I have to add, though, the, the red lights that they're in Brickle, I do not like. I'm okay with red lights, but just be red lights. Because the ones in Brickle, I drive past all the time. They're blinking, then they're, they're flashing. Solid. Nobody knows right. what to do. You're like, some right. people are going, some people are stopping. It's just either it's red It's a lot better than green. yellow, man. It. It's a yeah. lot better, Brett. It's a lot better yeah. than yellow. And this is a nice Yeah, but I'd rather just have a red light if we can. If we can wow. just have a red light or a green light, I think Councilman it's McCormick? Okay. So Councilman McCormick. I'm going to talk fast because I know we're running out of time. But, Jake, I think what you, I hope you're hearing from us is that, and, and Chief Press and uh, Steve, if you're listening, that we want this changed and fixed and addressed, and it has gone on for way too long. And we all understand the constraints with it being the county's lights. I understood years and years ago before Council Member Laredo, we heard that they right. couldn't even touch the lights because of some lawsuit and all these other things. Right. Whatever it takes and whatever the village has to do, I, I think I can say that we, we really want this done because the caller who called this at the beginning of this meeting is totally right. We've already had a horrific accident on Crandon Boulevard with a bicyclist, yes. and we don't want we don't want to just wait for the Agreed. next terrible right. accident. And we have an outstanding county commissioner, Ms. Regalado, is yep. a doer. She's coming out for some of this stuff uh, soon. So to yes, sir. To your comment, actually, I've sent a memo to to the the, the commissioner to Mayor Davis' office. Uh, and then she is on board a president's issue to county. We'll get it done. Yeah. She's Thank working you, on it. We Thank you. it go. Motion to adjourn. Just another item, crime and No, and that was over. We already talked about that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Cool.